All right, so I hope you all are doing good. Um, my guest tonight is a modern day musical renaissance man, Mr. Fernando Perdomo. And without further ado, live from California. Hi, Sean. Hey, brother, how's it going? Hey, can you see me? Not yet. We see your name in lights. So we're kind of hey man. How's it going? Oh, fabulous! Happy Saturday to you. Thank you. I'll take it. You know. Having go. I'm so excited about all the uh, amazing people that are going to be on it. I mean, come on, Rick Wakeman. How cool is that? Well, you know, it helps to hit people up when they're ready to do press for a new record. So I'm gonna sure. And Red Planet that. sounds really cool. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm digging it. I got an advanced oh, copy. Cover. What's that? The fact that he put a mini Moog on the cover is a fantastic. Oh, oh, it's just all over it. It's just like the classic Moog Rick soloing that we love so much, just dripping all over everything. So, I yeah. recently discovered a concert of his from 1984, uh, from the, from the 1984 album that's on YouTube, and it's uh, it's really interesting. Cause first of all, I'm a gear nerd, so um, the first thing I noticed in the video is that it's like he was signed on with Korg at the time. So it's all Korg, like the Lambda, the port, the polyphonic, mono, the polyphonic modular, you know, the, uh, the, the, all the, basically everything that they had, the organ, everything. So it was interesting. I mean, it still sounded like Rick, but definitely I was missing the mini mood, but it was a cool thing. Interesting band too. Well, you know, I'm going to ask him very delicately you know are there any sounds that haven't really aged well for you that you look back on and you go what was i thinking well i i could definitely answer that question <laughs> well, i could i mean i i venture to guess that it started around tormato and lasted till about 2000 but that's just my <laughs> assessment tormato gate as it happens with a lot of yes fans i don't mind the whole like birotron polymoog uh, Polymog Rick Wakeman era. That's perfectly fine with me because it's actually all analog and, and like Don't Kill the Whale and you know Arriving UFO and Release Release. Okay, it's very interesting sounds, but it's still what I would consider a very 1978-79 thing. If Eddie Jobson has got, had gotten the gig with Yes, he would have been also scrutinized because he's a different type of keyboard player and his CS80 polyphonic thing would have been uh, a similar thing. And I, I wonder if Rick was uh, acquired the polymoog when, when he was in the running to be the keyboard player in UK and uh, ended up, um, you know, as all, all of us do, there's a hot shot out there that you got to compete with. So I bet he was definitely influenced by guys like Eddie Jobson and Patrick Moraz and, you know, that uh, with, the, with the whole polyphonic thing, and he wanted to get in on that action, which is really cool. Uh, I guess I, what I'm really talking about is like when uh, Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, Howe happened, and uh, all of a sudden it was full digital. And right. stuff like the, the, the Korg T2 and the uh, DX, DX uh, uh, keyboard sounds and a lot of the plinky 90s digital stuff, which every, you know, he was keeping up with the times. But, you know, just as much as Bill Bruford was with his full Simmons kit. Yeah. So, you know, definitely, it's a little jarring to hear, to hear these classic songs without the Mellotron, the RMI Electro Piano, the Mini Moog, you know, even, even the Hammond organ he ditched. So it's like, you know, for a while, when I first saw Yes, um, actually, I first saw them with Igor, uh, and then I saw them with... I, you know what? I might have seen him first with Rick Wakeman because uh, I missed all the Raven era and I saw them on their first reunion right after uh, Keys to Ascension. His keyboard sounds were still, he had some great stuff going on, but he had a lot of like DX70 type stuff. So, so it was interesting to hear, uh, again, the Yes material without the classic sounds. And then when Igor came in, he brought in a lot of the classic sounds back. Um, and now Jeff is just nailing the sounds. I mean, it's really cool. Oh yeah, um, and um, you know I think Tom Brislin did a great job when he was in there as well. Oh yeah, and, and he's killing it with great. Kansas now. Perfect fit. So. Yeah, have you seen them with him yet? I haven't seen them live with him, but I've heard the record, and it sounds great. 
Uh, Tom is an incredible writer. The first thing I said when I found out that Tom Brislin was in Kansas was, I can't wait to hear him write with the band. Because, uh, you know, Carrie was a huge, the, the big change in Kansas was when Carrie left. Because Carrie was the, the songwriting, you know, zealot of the band. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, look, there's great, there's great writers in the band. Uh, and Walsh really came into his own uh, with the Steve Morse years. And, uh, you know, then stuff like uh, uh, in the 90s, it was like, it was a cool, there was a lot of appearances by Kerry as a writer. But now Brislin, not only is a devotee of, of Kansas, but he's a devotee of all Prague. And he's a great songwriter. He's a great pop songwriter. And he's a great singer. And I'm excited that he sings the track on the record. So there yeah, you that go. was a really good one. Um, really good. And uh, the song "The River Sang" is what it's called. Yeah. It's the last song on the album, and it stops just like Red Na Nightmare. It's like the tape just runs out, yeah, abruptly, you know. And that's it's pretty yeah. cool, actually. And they're they're in good hands. I actually got to work with uh, with uh, Zach Ritzvi. Um, I thought he pronounced his last name Ritzvi. I, I don't think it, I've ever heard anybody actually say it out loud, but I see it in writing uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that sounds about uh, right. Risby? Yeah, Zach was great. I mean, you know, uh, he was worked. Uh, Jeff Glicksman, I met Jeff Glicksman at South by Southwest, and we exchanged information, and he ended up really falling for my band DC3, and he flew us out to his studio in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and his engineer was Zach Ritzby. And uh, we were there working, and we did some demos. Uh, fired up the Hammond organ there. I did. I was the bass player in the band, and uh, he plugged me in to one of Dave Hope's old bass amps, which is oh, the nice. Sound City, uh, and it sounded amazing. And we had learned uh, "Carry On Wayward Son," and we just kind of blasted it in the studio, and he loved it. It was really, really cool. And he told us a lot of great stories about working with Kansas, and a lot of great stories about working with Ingve Malmsteen because uh, Glicksman went on to be Ingve Malmsteen's engineer. I like I, some early Ingve. You know that first Ingve record is a very important metal guitar record. It you know it, oh yeah it's set I was, the standard. You know when I was in high school. So so just just as a reference, I was born in 1980. I'm about to turn 40. I went to high school in the 90s, and I was listening to nothing but 70s music, while all my friends were listening to nothing but metal, and uh, most of my guitar friends were really into. Metallica, Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, uh, Ingve, uh, Megadeth, uh, Slayer. Uh, a lot, in Miami, there's a lot of Hispanics, and I'm Hispanic, but a lot of the South American Hispanics are absolutely crazy about metal. And oh, yeah. uh, I remember it's like I had like a, a 1968 Guild SQS S100, and all my friends had. Ibanez's ESPs and Flying V's. Sure. And they all had metal zones, and I had a, a, an Ampeg Verb Rocket, so I was the weirdo uh, <laughs> of the group. And you know what's funny is that um, one of my friends said, lent me a, a tape of Odyssey, uh, the uh, Ingve Malmsteen record. Oh, yeah. And I remember really digging it. And uh, years later, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's. Um, I'll, I'll never forget that song, Dreaming Tell Me, which is a beautiful song. I think I still know how to play it somehow. But uh, it was like a cool song. And I remember that one going, wow, man, I like that one because it's kind of prog. And uh, one of the things that they didn't realize was that a lot of metal was inspired by prog. And I was listening to all the stuff that all their favorite bands were into, like Iron Maiden. Wouldn't be Iron Maiden if it wasn't for King Crimson and Genesis. Um, right. Metallica wouldn't be Metallica if it wasn't for... Uh, Actually, the, I think what I consider one of their biggest influences is early year I heat. You know, a lot of that. Sure. that uh, that's and and um, and uh, what's the other uh, damn band? Oh, hold on. What's the band with the lead with the dual lead solos? Early seventies. Uh, uh, Wishbone Ash. Wishbone Ash. <laughs> Wishbone Ash. Uriah Heep. Uh, Budgie. Big influences on them, and. Um, in middle school, I had a very funny thing happen. Um, see, in middle school, grunge hit. And all my friends were growing their hair long and listening to Nirvana, um, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden. And there was a, uh, a local, uh, the middle school had a band that was starting to put together. They called themselves the Hairballs. 
and they were going to do the um, they were going to do the Battle of the Bands, like you know, like the talent show, and they they were going to do a live by Pearl Jam. And I asked if I could join, and they're like, "Your hair isn't long enough, and you listen to Grandpa Rock and whatever." <laughs> so it was it was really really funny because I did the talent show. And I did Sugar Mountain by Neil Young with an acoustic guitar and a harmonica holder. And I won the talent show. And they all teased me again. You won with your grandpa rock because all the judges are old. Well, two weeks later was the MTV Video Music Awards. And I'm watching it because I watched every year because I, I was an MTV kid. And I'm watching Pearl Jam. And I noticed a Les Paul on stage that looked a lot like Neil Young's. And I'm like, oh, wow, they have a Les Paul of a Bigsby. That's pretty cool. All of a sudden, Neil Young came out and they did Rockin' in the Free World. Sure. And I wish I would have recorded the next day in middle school when everyone came up to me and said, dude, your grandpa rock is, our, is, is Pearl Jam's biggest influence and they brought out your Neil Young guy. We had no idea that they were into him. I'm like, duh, duh. Right. But it was really funny. It was a really funny experience because, again, I was, I had short hair. I played Grandpa Rock. I used to wear Beatles shirts. I used to get teased by kids in like New Kids on the Block shirts for wearing an Abbey Road t shirt. You know, I used to wear a Kansas t shirt. I, I, one of the first concerts I ever went to was Kansas. And I had a Kansas uh, Point of No Return t shirt, and they were always laughing at me. But, you know, I that's 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 always been the way i am i mean yeah, well, you, um, well, you, you get the last laugh now <laughs> oh 100 percent. because you know it's really funny how um a lot of music hasn't aged very well and a music a lot of music has and uh a lot of the grandpa rock i listened to is now bigger than ever and a lot of the stuff that was kind of like hip back then is really kind of you know not really doing too much these days so it's cool that that I was kind of like ahead of its time because, you know, I didn't have, I mean, until high school, I didn't have any friends to listen to the music I did. And then in high school, I met a kid named Roger Hudai, who is in a band called X Norwegian, who later I was in a band called Transcendence with me, with Bill Summer and your friend and, mm -hmm. uh, and our friend. And um, Roger auditioned to me. I had a rock, we had a rock ensemble in my high school. Um, so, and we are, it was a cool class. I mean, we did, Sergeant Pepper as a show, you know, we did all sorts of really cool things. We recorded an album and he auditioned for a uh, rock ensemble with To Cry You, um, to, to, was it uh, uh, a Jethro Tull song called To Cry You a, a, a Song, To Cry You a Song. Sure, I love like, it. Who is this kid? And uh, it turns out that I had met him a few years ago um, uh, when I was mentoring some kids at the local elementary school uh, when I was still in middle school. And uh, we ended up finding out that we both had four track machines and we started a little four track band called Dip. And uh, there's a recording online of us doing Happy Family by King Crimson when we were both, both 16, 17. And we just literally like we called a friend of ours who played saxophone, plugged his sax into a wah wah, did the sax solo, it sounded like traffic. And I played drums and I played uh, bass, he played guitar. Uh, and he sang it and you know we were the 16 year old hispanic kids in miami playing a bizarre um uh, album cut by king crimson off their least popular album an album that robert fripp has said that he completely disowns and that he doesn't trust anybody who likes it well i like it I, in fact i would put it in my top three king crimson records lizard but lizard of all things yeah. Uh, somebody asked today on Facebook, what are your five favorite King Crimson drummers? My five were so weird. I mean, Bruford, number one. Got Giles, number two. I put Andy McCulloch, number three, which is, you know, he was the drummer on Lizard. I put Ian Wallace, the drummer on Islands and, 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 uh, and Earthbound, number four. And number five, I decided to put, uh, <laughs> I decided to put Jeremy Stacy, Gavin uh, Harrison, and Pat Mastelotto as one. Okay, put well, them that, five. that's kind of the so idea. I so. kind of consider them one big drummer. 
Right. You know, it's like one brain between yeah, the three of them. I should put in parentheses Bill Rifflin because you know he he right. was the first of the of the uh, the first third guy, and rest in peace. But uh, but yeah, it's a, it's amazing going to see Kieran Crimson now because it's a drum line. It's so cool. Oh, it's know? like it's like hot potato. You know, it's, it's like you got it. I got you know. It's it's a thing to behold, and people are like. Oh, you really need three drummers to take Bill Bruford's place, and it's like, no, that's that's not oh. it. You you don't, you don't get well, it. That's the thing about King Crimson is that he they're not taking Bill Bruford's place. King Crimson is not a band that's self-referential. It's yeah. a band that moves forward. And the thing I love uh, the most about the the eight man, seven man King Crimson is that they're playing stuff from every era, but they're giving it new life. You know, they're doing stuff like Islands. They're doing stuff like. Uh, the Lizard Suite, uh, Battle of Glass Tears, and the Letters, and uh, it's stuff that I never thought I would ever hear live. Like, oh right, you know, freaking Man of City, uh, you know, Pictures of the City, uh, Sailor's uh, Tale, like, yeah, yeah, Sailor's Tale. You know, come on, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. So it's you know, see them. And twenty years ago, we never would have dreamed of seeing hearing any of this stuff live. It was just like, yeah, it, this is never going to happen. I just have to live with it. You know, I wouldn't even imagine. But, I, you know, I think some talk started on some internet forums and such after, you know, you know, like, hey, bring back the woodwinds. I think that was the first thing people started saying, you know, and it's like, well, if you bring them back, then they're going to want to hear that old stuff. How are you going to deal with it? So I think that kind of set a little germ in Crip's head to yeah. realign everything. I thought I would ever meet Mel Collins, and I met him, and he was so cool. And it's just like, again, it's so great, because this is like the dream King Crimson for me, because... You know, it took me a while to warm up to the uh, 80s King Crimson because it was so against some of my cardinal rules. You know, the uh, chorus on the guitar, the kind of slappy bass thing, which I didn't know was a stick, and the kind of like, you know, a lot of 4-4 and a lot of poppy stuff. And and after a while, I think what, what made me become a convert was when I found Adrian Ballou's album Inner Revolution oh, in a dollar <laughs> bin at Specs Music in Miami. And that became my favorite album that year. And his pop songwriting is so brilliant. That song, The War in the Gulf Between Us. Oh, wow. My God, it's incredible. That album gives me chills just thinking about it. And then I warmed up to the, you know, Discipline Beat, uh, Three of the Perfect Pair. And then Thrack hit, and it blew oh, my yeah. mind. And oh, yeah, mine too. Thrack was incredible. And um, I saw the double trio tour in 1995 and it blew my head wide open i mean i was just like in heaven bruford mastelato gun levin you know fripp and baloo and doing stuff like uh you know uh, walking on air uh and, and and uh you know just just like it blew my mind just to see this wave of sound hit me i'm 14 years old and this music is cracking my skull wide open. And I was just like, mind blown. And I got obsessed with uh, Adrian Ballou's style. And, you know, he's an amazing, amazing guitar player. And he's been great with me. And, uh, you know. Yeah, you've gotten to know him pretty well, haven't you? I've gotten to know him pretty well. And, uh, you know, I named my son after him, Adrian Ballou, which is uh, incredible. He actually, this is a funny story. I opened up for Adrian Ballou for the first time in cleveland at a place called the winchester uh i had some friends i was producing who owned the club and they said hey uh you want to open up for adrian blue while you're out here and i opened up for adrian and i told adrian you know my girlfriend's pregnant he's like is it gonna be a boy and i'm like yeah he's like well you should name him adrian because it's a cool name it's a rare name and i picked it for myself because my name is robert robert blue <laughs> and oh, i was really? like really okay so i immediately called uh girlfriend i was like like okay we're naming him adrian and she's like oh i don't like that don't, i don't mind that that's pretty cool and i said adrian huh. blue perdomo and uh, the only thing she did was like is i was thinking blue and she changed it to blu so it's kind of cool it's really cool so he's a prog kid next generation cool. prog. it reminds me of steve walsh's kid you know his son's name is blue b-l-e-u blue really? walsh yeah hey that's so, kind I of cool common with steve walsh yeah it's incredible the color yeah yeah, yeah um, cool. oh you know i'd love to have adrian on here some night and if we can make it happen i'd love to have you co-host 
have the connection. I'll 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 uh, I'll reach out into it. I, you know, been, uh, he's like to way up my list. I would love oh, to have him on. It's great. He's in Nashville. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, so not far. He's, uh, he's he's uh, you know he's 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 pretty deep into a record right now. He's doing the right thing during lockdown. He's making well, the record. Yeah, you get plenty of time to work on music. Uh, I loved his last album. It, the name of it escapes me now. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, man, that is just such a ear candy nuggets just galore it's like if you love the pop side of adrian you know he hasn't lost a step and it's yeah well that's right the now. thing about adrian that's that's yeah. um a real anomaly um you don't think of a lot of prog guys that could also write great songs oh absolutely you know pop i mean no look there's lots of prog guys that could write great songs but to have a situation like adrian Ballou where he could write you know something as just awkward and, and weird as like cage or you know or or uh um just like bizarre stuff but also write something as beautiful as you know as, as freaking heartbeat you know and and uh and three or perfect pair be able to write a pop song with such weird time signatures and you know I'm, I'm, I'm underneath all the prog you know dinosaurs are beatles song you yeah know, that's beatles you know but I've, I've been very lucky to to work with some great prog guys that could write great songs dave kersner writes great songs oh yeah you know, underneath all prog facade you take a song like the lie or into the sun you know or just so many songs uh, chain reaction and there's pop there there's pop chops you know even though he's he's uh he's deep into the prog um you know, he's got a lot of pop influences too. He's really big into Jellyfish. You know, he worked with with Kevin Gilbert for years, who's oh, another yeah. guy who's prog pop together because the same guy that wrote something as crazy as Goodness Gracious wrote something as pop as All I Want to Do for Cheryl Crow and Right, and, yeah. Know, leaving um, lots. Yes, you know, these are pop gems. And well, I'd, lo I'd love, to, I'd like to say, I'd love to have Dave on the show sometime. So, Dave, if you're watching, what? let's make yeah. it happen, man. But yeah, it's been a real learning process, cool, because like, you know, underneath all of these prog songs that Dave writes, there's pop and there's real pop songs. I mean, there's real hooks, real choruses. And what I love about like the prog that we do is that it's not necessarily chops based. You know, it's not riff based. It's not like, you know, there's he's been he's delved into that stuff. But most of the stuff is something that could be broken down to an acoustic guitar or a vocal and still work. You know, a lot of this like kind of metal prog stuff, it needs all that bombast. It does. Know? And, you know, I think that's one of the things that, that made you stand out in a sea of progress is that you and Dave as well, um, you know, really regard great pop and love it and understand it. And I find that, you know, a lot of prog mindset is kind of like, Oh, I'm too cool for anything that simple, you know. So I'm, you know, you know, break out your calculator every time you put a record on, and it's like, you know, there's a place for that. There's an audience for that, but that's not really what and, I want to hear. You know, you I want to hear a great song out, first. You have to pick out my ten favorite records. It's not all prog. Yeah, yeah you, you ready for those? It, you want to do those now? Me, the thing about me growing up is, I actually had to find my own thing because my parents weren't really like rock people. My mom played piano but she was more of like a classical world music person. Uh, my brother had some disco records and some stuff, but he wasn't really music, you know, heavy. And uh, my, my secret is uh, we couldn't afford going to a record store. So we'd go to the flea market. And uh, when I was, you know, five to seven or eight, I, um, I bought toys with whatever money my mom would give me every Sunday. And after a while, I realized that, okay, she's giving me five bucks every Sunday. I could come home with either three toys or 10 records. And I suddenly started buying records by the shitload and like, you know, big, like this little kid with like 10 records in his arms. And I would buy anything that looked cool or anything that had gear on it that I liked. And after a while I was like a 14 year old kid with a thousand records. That's and awesome. I was listening to everything from Chuck Mangione to Tori Amos to Kate Bush, to Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And all of a sudden, I got really heavy into, yes, King Crimson, 
Giles, Giles and Fripp, um, Flash, Curved Air. But then I was really into stuff like the Cardigans and Ben Folds 5 and, uh, you know, because I had to listen to some music that was also popular. So, so for some reason I got into stuff like, you know, I got into Tori really big. I got into Blind Melon, uh, which this this weekend was the 15th anniversary of Shannon Hoon dying. And that, that. man, Blind Melon was a huge influence. I yeah, love them. Isn't there a new documentary coming out? Yeah, there's a whole documentary and it's kind of like, I, I bet it's not going to be a fun thing because Shannon Hoon is one of the most biggest tragic stories of, of history. So, you know, and, and incredible. And you know, what's funny is one of the first things I noticed is that I, I was an early adopter of AOL. And I remember people saying, Shannon Hoon, he's got a lot of John Anderson in his voice. And I knew who John Anderson was. And I was like, oh my God, my worlds are colliding. It's right. yes, a yes reference talking about a band that's on MTV. Whoa. I've cool. heard that comparison before. Yeah. You could totally tell it on the song uh, Toes Across the Floor. Totally <laughs> sounds like John. And it's great. That's an amazing stuff. And I would have loved to have worked with him. Uh, my band, the Dirty Diamond, uh, did a show opening up for um, opening up for the current version of uh, Blind Melon, and Christopher Thorne is still there, and a couple of the other guys. And they were great. Their new singer is fantastic. You know, That's awesome. Yeah. So I have no. I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, I won't see yes unless John Anderson's there. I don't mind as long as there's a yes. That's all that matters. You know, the music that, the thing. You know, yeah. we could go down that rabbit hole for ten minutes. Why don't I'm we? The person uh, to go down that rabbit hole. You know, with. because you know, people ask. You know, the whole thing. You know, there's only two members left. It is. It's no. almost a tribute band, and it's like no. And even here's the thing. It's like I have a friend that has a fantastic Genesis tribute called Abacab out of North Carolina. Yeah. When they come to town and play those songs, man, it moves me. Man, that music is still majestic and brilliant in a live setting when it's played correctly. And there's no original members at all. So you know, it's like. The music's at the core of it, you know. I so, mentioned Blood, Sweat, and Tears. That's one of my top five. Yeah, but they bands. had like a hundred people in their band over the years. I never saw Blood, Sweat, and Tears with any original members but David Clayton Thomas. And it didn't bother me because I was just blown away to hear this music. And um, David Clayton Thomas has retired from touring. So the current version of Blood, Sweat, and Tears has no original or classic members. And if you go to their website, there's a little thing written by Bobby Colombi, who's the original drummer, who manages the band still. And he says, I get asked all the time, Bobby, why aren't there any original members left in Blood, Sweat, and Tears? And he always says this, are there any original members left in the London, London Philharmonic? Are there <laughs> right. any original members left in the New York Yankees? People still go because it's not about the people. It's about the music. And he says, every member of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, if they would have walked in in 1967, would have gotten the gig. They're all worthy of being in Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And he says that all these bands that are breaking up because there's no original members left, they're not going to be around in 200 years keeping the music alive. You sure. know, the London Philharmonic, they, they, they're going to go on forever. And all these bands that are breaking up when they lose members... There's going to be no yes if, 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 if by that, you know, I want Adrian's grandkids to still be able to see yes, because it's about the music. It's not about the people. It really That's is. What, you know, I mean, I've had the pleasure of seeing about every yes tour in the past 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'll admit that, you know, there there was a certain magic to the five piece lineup, you know, that did tales and going for the one. And it was a real pleasure to see them around 2002 through 2004. Mm -hmm. but I've enjoyed, you know, every version since then. And it's kind of interesting to go see a show, you know, in the last 10 years, and kind of look around and notice all the teenagers in the audience. And you know, think this is the first time they've ever heard this stuff. And it's going to blow their minds, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's just a majestic thing, you know, and it's just when it gets fired up in a good concert hall, it's, there's just nothing like it. So, um, going to a know. yes show is an unbelievable experience, no matter what, because this music yeah. is magical and I've enjoyed every show. 
I have my favorite shows. I have my least favorite shows. But it's not about who's on stage. It's about the general vibe. And uh, my favorite, man, I mean, God, when Yes is on, which is most of the time, and actually, to be honest, they've been really on since, the, since Billy came along. He's been an incredible force in that band. And he really has. We're, it was horrible to lose. God, the worst ever two years in Prague was when we lost Squire, Wetton, Lake. Emerson. You know, Emerson. God, I mean, it was like the apocalypse. It really and, was. Uh, was, a, was, was. I cried. I cried when I heard Squire died. Oh, me too, man. I, and I hadn't felt like that since my folks passed away. So yeah. I felt like a, fem- a, you know, such a wonderful personality and such an important person in the whole scheme of progressive rock. And I met him once at NAM, and he was very nice to me. He, uh, he was brilliant. And, uh, you know, we're all lucky that someone like Billy was already ready to jump in and, uh, and, carry the flame because man that's that's a tough guy to replace you know oh, and absolutely. Billy's a job and billy's an, another guy that's a prog dude that could write a damn good song you know and and uh i've really enjoyed checking out his solo records and world trade and uh really nice guy i, I would love to work with him sometime yeah you know, and does. um you know the conspiracy albums that he did with chris are really great too if y'all it's i don't killed. know if y'all if any of you out there haven't heard those, you know, Chris Squire and Billy Sherwood did a number of collaborations through the 90s and under the name Conspiracy. And the first album, didn't that have Steve Stevens on it doing his flamenco guitar stuff on it and stuff? Yeah. yeah I think he was on there. Yeah, and, that, and that brings me to my next subject, which is underrated guitar players. Um, which Peter Banks. We'll in a minute. Peter you know, Banks. Peter, Peter Banks. of course. Right. Absolutely. Top of the list. You want you want me you want me to give you my top five most underrated guitar players in my opinion? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and think a few of my own. Yeah, Peter Banks, because you know he was he was in a, a tough situation where the guy who replaced him became God, and Steve Howe is God. He's he is he is a monolith. Uh, Adrian Ballou said it best that Steve Howe is the most complete guitar player because. He is just a badass at everything he does. And he's incredible. But Peter Banks created the style. And if you check out anything that Steve Howe did before he joined Yes, he had a different style. And and I've personally have learned so much learning other people's songs in a replacement situation because you have to be able to sort of mimic the sound of the guy that came before you. Sure. And uh, a lot of the basic building blocks of what we consider the Steve Howe sound was created by Peter Banks, like the volume swells, mm-hmm. the uh, the kind of aggressive rhythm playing, and the jazz stuff, which is really, really cool. And um, so Peter Banks, definitely number one. I have a weird number two, Peter Svensson from Cardigans. Oh, wow. One of the greatest guitar players that nobody ever thinks about because they're considered a one-hit wonder in America. And uh, it's funny because in America, they could barely, they don't tour here because they could barely fit a thousand people in a room. But they play stadiums in Europe. And they're wow. a one-hit wonder in America. And they're like a 15-hit wonder in Europe. And uh, their albums are mind-blowing guitar statements and uh he taught me so much about chord voicings so much about guitar arrangement and so much about unpredictable um magic and uh i recommend anybody here to pick up a record called emmerdale which is their first album and another record called life which is their second album and it's some of the most mind melting amazing guitar playing of the 90s that you know i guess peter svensson would fit in the same place that guys like johnny marr fit in for a lot of the modern guys i know that they consider him to be their sleeper influence like oh yeah you know 
Johnny Marr, Peter Buck, and and uh, uh, you know that that whole scene. No, no, Peter Svensson is kind of like one of my secret like uh, ingredients of my guitar playing. And um, my God, those Cardigans records blew my mind open and uh, really, really cool. Another guy that nobody ever talks about is a guy named Steve Caton, who played on all the Tori Amos records. And uh, he was never a lead guitar player. He was kind of his idea of a lead was kind of like a, a, a ethereal thing because playing with, with Tori Amos was very interesting. She never really had a band until uh, From the Crowd Girl Hotel, which came out in 97, 96. And until then, all her shows would be just her and a guitar player sitting down, playing the most beautiful volume swells and arpeggios and uh, just incredible stuff. And, uh, you know, Steve was a huge influence on me. Um, and uh, just just on magical guitar orchestration. And his guitar playing on Little Earthquakes, Under the Pink, Boys for Pele, Choir Girl Hotel, to Venus and Back. Those, that, that's some stuff that's like, it's life changing to me. Because again, it was popular music that was on MTV and the radio that had unorthodox guitar in it because it wasn't your typical power chords and leads. It was the guitar as an orchestra. And it really blew my mind open. And nobody talks, nobody talks about Steve Cate. And what's He's a good got, album to suggest? From the Choir Girl Hotel. Okay, yep, that's a biggie. Steve Cate on guitar, Matt Chamberlain on drums. Oh, wow. The amazing Justin Mendel Johnson on bass. And uh, that record, I get chills just thinking about that record. I um, that's kind. Camped out, I camped out at Uncle Sam's Music in Miami. Uh, the day, the night of release, and at midnight they had a big listening section, and I remember standing there at Uncle Sam's Music at midnight, and chills going all over my body, and it was just like the most magical feeling of hearing these incredible songs. And that record is a mind blow. I mean, that record, that record is is beyond incredible. Number four, underrated guitar player, my favorite guitar player of all time, Todd Rundgren. Of course. Because that's the thing is that Todd did so much that nobody ever talks about him as a guitar player. They always say, Todd Rundgren, hello, it's me, singer, you know, the singer, yeah, right, you know, guy on AM radio. And oh, the guy that produced Meatloaf. Nobody talks about the fact that he played every guitar note on that record. Exactly. Nobody talks about the fact that he played guitar solos on Hollow Notes records. Nobody talks about the fact that he ended up playing a lot of the guitar on a Cheap Trick record on you know on, on Next Position Please. He was, and is, one of those guitar players that you go see live, and every note he plays hits you right in the heart, and impales you. I mean, it's just like, number one, he's always playing too loud. Number two, his tone is very piercing, so it does hit you hard. But man, I have gotten very emotional listening to Todd play. And some of his guitar playing is so beautiful. I mean, the slide guitar on on, on a Freak Parade, you know, oh, the yeah. crazy guitar flow that he does on a uh, uh, Freaking man, I mean, so many amazing parts that he's done, so many incredible things that, that he's done over his incredible career, and he still is a very amazing force. Uh, oh, there's so many great solos. Um, the last ride pops in my head almost immediately. Yeah, right, <laughs> I mean, a... the, the, the yeah, the end of just one victory. Um, oh, yeah, Love long, it. flowing, incredible solo playing on, on, uh, on the entire Todd Rungan's Utopia record. I mean, it's just like. He was, his entire career was based on reinventing himself. And you got to understand that it was a, a, an incredible, um, an incredible ballsy move to follow up Hello, It's Me 
with this, a prog record with three keyboard players. And he recorded this record with a double neck and uh, the old, uh, um, the old uh, Eric Clapton SG. And he's going full McLaughlin at points. And he's okay. like, he's got the chops. He's got the tone. He's got the vocabulary. And he's got something that not, no other guitar player I know has, which is a guitar vibrato that is influenced by synth players. Um, one of the interesting things about Todd is that for a lot of these records, he played a Fender Mustang. And the only reason he played a Fender Mustang is because it had it was the only guitar with vibrato bar that went up and down. Right. And he wanted to be able to take a note up and take a note down and then dump it all the way down. And before the Floyd Rose, that was the only way to do it. And if you hear a lot of his guitar solos, it's there's a lot of Jan Hammer in there. There's a lot of, you know, Chick Corea. There's a lot of, uh, of uh, Keith Emerson. There's a lot of Rick Wakeman. And he was obsessed with Prague. And the funny thing about the, the first Utopia is that he walked in one day with the guys that played on Wizard of True Star and said, we're going to make a Prague record. Uh, let's go to go home, listen to Mahavishnu Orchestra for a few days, and I'll see you on Friday. And we're going to make a, a song that's 32 minutes long, and that's the icon. And the funny thing about it is that all these guys, uh, Kevin Allman was playing with, with Bette Midler, you know, uh, uh, Moogie Klingman was was you know kind of like a kind of like a, a Bob Dylan uh, you know kind of folk the band type guy. Ralph Shuckett played the organ on on uh, on Tapestry by Carol King. You know uh, John Siegler played a jazz bass with flat wound strings because his favorite bass player was James Jamerson. So that's the cool thing about Utopia oh, yeah. is that it's prog with non prog musicians that are playing something new and uh john siegler is a big 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 influence on me on bass and the oh, cool thing about john is that he's basically a funk bass player you know did you, you see know? them about 10 years ago when they reunited that lineup and toured play that stuff is right after moogie passed away yeah i saw i saw both moogie both of moogie's last shows you went to new york eh? new york with the high line Oh, very cool. There's a DVD out of that now, I believe. Yeah, and uh, I was there, and it was mind blowing. And uh, I was writing for Keyboard Magazine, and I actually did Moogie's last interview, which was uh, which was about uh, fighting fighting cancer with music. And sadly, he died right after that came out. And he was talking about how he was like super excited to do this tour, and he took a turn for the worst and died right before the tour. And they already booked the tour, so they did the tour with just Ralph, and uh, it was it was good. It was it was cool. It was just how could they go on with that tour with Moogie dying? It was just like I can't imagine. And uh, they made it happen, and they sounded great, you know. But um, again, it was great to see the music, and this is an example of like okay, it was all the original guys: Ralph Shuckett, John Siegler, Kevin Elman. Uh, you know, Chasm was up there doing stuff to Todd, but you know, I would love to hear that music played with a little more, you know, pizzazz. Sometimes, I mean, they they were they they played it. I feel like everything was a little slow, you know, because they had played pop for so many years, and I felt like it could have been a little more fast and rocking and incredible. Because this album is is a mind blower. This album, I I put on Utopia theme. And I can't stop jumping around. I remember hearing it for the first time at a record store. And I literally was jumping around in the store, losing my mind. It's overwhelming music. I, yeah, I mean, everybody has to have that. Prog rock fans, if you haven't got that first Utopia album, go get it now. I mean, there's a sidelong <laughs> epic on it, the icon. That alone will just blow your mind. And the other side of it is just as brilliant. And um, you know, thing, so, uh, Todd Rogers' Utopia. Um, the, another live and raw yeah another yeah. live and raw that's the oh, prog streak and I, i'd throw an initiation too because i think it slots nicely in there with those we're talking about initiation so one of the most mind-blowing facts about the song initiation is that it's possibly the only song with steve gadd and uh, bernard purdy on it and they're in stereo oh wow steve i had gadd, no idea Bernard purdy's on the right All right and who is it on sax? Is it Sanborn or Edgar Winter? They're both on that album. I can't remember who's on what songs, though. It's Sanborn. 
I thought so. Okay. Anborn also played the solo on uh, on um, uh, Zen Archer on on um, okay. on the star. So Edgar Winter's on Fair Warning. Edgar Winter Band is on Fair Warning. Oh, that's, wow. very that's cool. Edgar Winter Band backing him up. So that's that's uh, yeah, Dan, Dan Hartman. Hartman. And, yeah. Yeah, Dan Hartman's a kind of an underrated guy. A lot of people don't know. Another guy that ended up writing great pop songs. Yeah. <laughs> I heard like when I was in seventh grade, the drill team did a, a routine to this tune called Instant Replay. I was like, yeah, what a yeah, catchy fucking song. Yeah, that's yeah. funny though because uh, yeah, that's a, such a weird one with uh, the video. It's like G.E. Smith on bass and Vinnie Smith Vincent on guitar. And uh, what's the name of the guitar player? The guy who replaced Ace Freely? Yeah, Vinnie Vincent. Vinnie Vincent. Yeah. <laughs> Just standing Vinnie there Vincent. chucking out some disco funk octaves and things, you know. And uh, But that's a great tune. Um, yeah, Dan yeah. Hartman's very underrated because he he ended up he he basically wrote Frankenstein. Yeah, he's know? great. But he like bass playing on all those albums. That's all him. And it's, it's there's a really cool video of them doing free ride, and he's got a double neck Strat P bass, and he plays the da 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 I thought so. I remember I remember Ed or um, Edgar saying, you know, nobody ever really played that that rhythm part as well as he did like you know yeah. there's something about it. have you seen that picture i saw one recently where he has this like space suit with a base attached to it okay so i'm part of this page on facebook called ugly guitars mm -hmm. and that picture has been posted so many times that's one of the pictures that you're not allowed to post anymore oh really so it's bad the, huh? <laughs> the base suit and it's basically it's a jumpsuit with a built-in base and um i can't find any video of him using it because I have a feeling it was just for the photo because that's just a little too far. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Well, um, legendary. So yeah. And then he went on to that he had that big eighties hit, um, from moving sidewalks. But yeah. 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 He was a genius. Dream too, about because you. He was a genius. He was a, he was a white boy and he did this like soul song and the video was a bunch of like black singers. So right. it's like, but he knew that it was just like, underneath that voice was this like you know kind of you know white guy you know effeminate white guy <laughs> basically yeah 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 so you know he was a genius yeah. uh number five most underrated guitar player dc deville ian, ian barnson one more time ian barnson ian barnson telling me more Our for all the Alan Parsons records. Oh, okay. Yeah. He was in a band called Pilot. Oh, yeah. Ho, ho, ho. It's magic. Which he didn't play guitar on. Oh, because well, I love joined right the song. That was the first song that was recorded, and David Payton played bass and guitar on that. And then Ian Barnson joined when they did January. Oh, yeah. Okay. Ian Barnson also played the iconic guitar solo on Withering Heights by Kate Bush. Oh wow! And uh, he was kind of like the Wrecking Crew of the Wrecking Crew of London, late seventies. Was a guy named Stuart Elliott on drums, a guy named uh, Duncan McKay, Mackay on keyboards, and a guy named David Payton on bass, and a guy named Ian Bartson on guitar, and guys like Ray Cooper and Morris Parrott on percussion and stuff like that. And they played on everything. And Ian Barnson, every solo of his, you could sing. And there's a song called uh, If I Could Change Your Mind, which is off of the album Eve by Alan Parsons, that has the most amazing guitar line that you will ever hear. It is the song. And you know what's cool about that track is that it's Leslie Duncan on vocals, who wrote a uh, love song for Elton John. And she has the most amazing voice. And when I met Alan Parsons, I said, Alan, I'm a guitar player. My biggest influence is Ian Barnson. And my favorite song of yours is If You Could Change My Mind by Les you know, Leslie Duncan. He says, that was the greatest vocal I've ever recorded in my entire life. Wow. And he's done everything from yeah. Sgt. Pepper. A long list. To, to, uh, you know, to, to Let It Be, to, you know, uh, all those incredible Ambrosia records. Talk about another insanely underrated guitar player. I was to say, David that's Pack. on my list, but obviously we agree, David Pack. Give me yours. Oh, I thought, isn't it David that plays all those solos? Huh? 
on Ambrosia Records. David Lee, Pack? Yeah, I was going to say David Pack, man. He's fucking He's awesome. David Pack, David Pack, man. David Pack is incredible. And some of the guitar playing, especially on the first two records, it's just mind-blowing. And they were one of the greatest American prog bands. And they're just off the charts, off the charts. And I love them. I've never seen them with David, and uh, that is one of my dream gigs: is playing guitar with Ambrosia. I would, I would love to. They need a singer now. I wish I could sing high like David Pack, because man, I would love to be an Ambrosia. I love those guys. They're based here in, you know, in in, in my my neck of the woods. You know, freaking uh, uh, freaking Burley Drummond, man. What an incredible drummer. Oh yeah, know? and um. I really got into this band called King Washington, my favorite local LA band. And I found, my mind was blown when I found out that Joe Puerta produced them in his studio in Milwaukee, which he has a studio in Milwaukee, which is another whole story. <laughs> and uh, Joe Puerta is an incredible bass player. Oh yeah. One of the best bass ever. Great singer too. Just because it's, again, a band that had, that could, that could write great prog, like Nice Very Nice and Cowboy Star and uh and and uh and 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 and, and uh and all that stuff somewhere i've never traveled time and they could also write no amazing pop tunes like best part of me and and uh you know it's incredible or you kind yeah. of straddle the line between the two like um that tune um about la what's it called not oh, yeah. to know yeah uh life, life beyond la life beyond la yeah i love that um uh, my band opened for robert berry last fall and he opened oh cool yeah yeah, he know he was with them for a little while in the '90s and stuff. And yeah, it was Robert's incredible. The one song he chose that to play from them, and it was really cool. Awesome. Okay, awesome. well, I have a couple. Yeah, I was going to say David. Sure. Another one, Glenn Tilbrook from Squeeze. Yes. Oh my God, yeah. man! Solo on uh, on uh, another. Not the nail in my uh, heart. Yes. One. On that Shit. Yamaha, Carlos Santana in the video. Man, what a solo! Oh man, every note is just perfectly placed. And, um, you know, I mean, he's an amazing singer. Everybody thinks of him as, you know, a singer, but wow, you know, super, super guitar player. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and I mean, it's, I, I've got to, I've got to delve more, but again, the solo on Another Nail in My Heart is a perfect example of a solo that defies its times because the 80s was not a time of clean, melodic guitar solos. Oh no. Our solo there was the whole eddie van halen school which is a lot of distortion and whammy bar and wanking you know yeah, exactly. and it's like to have a, a song be on the radio with a solo like that another great song from the 80s that has amazing solo hello by lionel richie oh yeah who that, was that that was paul jackson jr oh, yeah. he's the guitar player on beat it and you know what's crazy is there's a tall tale that Peter Banks cut a guitar solo on that song. And uh, I would love to hear his solo because, damn it, that would have brought him back. Oh, no doubt. Oh. Another, he had his story, his, his post-Empire life was, was very, very difficult. Um, because, again, oh, you're the guitar player, and yes, I love Roundabout. You know, <laughs> hard on gone you know it's oh. a hard thing because it's like you know when you're there's um my friend eddie zine who passed away who's an incredible drummer played in a ver in a bunch of versions of fog hat and uh he ended up in a version of fog hat with tony stevens who was their original bass player but he's not on slow ride <laughs> so imagine that you know it's like oh you were the bass player in fog hat i love slow ride mm. all right yeah. It's tough when you're not on the hit. I, yeah, it's true. And uh, yes, didn't really have. Imagine how many times Steve Howe's gone up to somebody and said, oh, I'm the guitar player. And yes, oh, I love Owner of a Lonely Heart. Right, right. exactly. You know, it's funny. I was talking to Tom Brislin about that a few weeks ago. Um, You know, the symphonic tour. I don't know yeah. if you remember, but he played the, the Owner of a Lonely Heart solo on the synth. Yeah. Instead I, I, of Steve I, I, doing it. And, you know, he said, oh, that was my idea. Just, you know, John and Chris were like, just go in and ask him, what have you got to lose? And he thought, you know, Steve would shoot him down. But instead, Steve's like, well, I think people would rather hear you do that than hear me play it anyway. So um, so he did. And, you know, Steve played on the end of it like he always does. But, you know, yeah, it's tough to be somebody else like that. You know, it's just it's a it's a 
a losing proposition in most cases. Psychology and rock. That's actually a book that needs to be written about <laughs> the psychology of what it's like to be able to survive in the music business. Because there's so many things. I mean, there's so many, there's so many cases of uh, Shannon Hoon, you know, depression. There's two ways to kill yourself. And he, he did the drugs way. You know, I consider a drug overdose suicide, you know, because you do do it to it to yourself. And it's like the psychology of going through what we go through. I, it's, it's no, it's, it's no surprise that there's so much depression and drug abuse and suicide because what we all have to go through to be able to number one, have a career, number two, maintain a career, number three, deal with musicians on a daily basis, which are by far some of the most unpredictable, idiotic, and completely uh, off the rails people in the world, take it from me. And then the touring life, I mean, man, you know, I recently uh, showed my girlfriend, uh, uh, Cindy, uh, we, we watched uh, Spinal Tap. And the classic thing is that a lot of musicians find that movie not very funny because it's real. It's too real. Because all that stuff that they're making fun of is the stuff that actually causes a lot of the depression in the music industry. Right. Oh my God, people aren't coming to the shows anymore. Nobody came to our, to our CD signing. You know, we're opening up for a puppet show. We were playing the stadiums 10 years ago, you know. And that's, all, that's, that's actually the best case scenario where they made it. I've had so many close calls where I've been playing in bands that should have been huge that didn't even get signed, you know, or worse, got signed and shelved, you know. I mean, that's like the whole concept of a label signing a band, recording their album, and putting it on a shelf. That's horrible. Yeah. You know? After all that for nothing, you know, that's the worst. It's difficult. And, you know, I think some people looking on from in from the outside probably, you know, think, oh, my God, that guy can play guitar. So amazing. He must just feel like he's made it. And, you know, it's, it's almost like chops don't keep you warm at night, you know, like That's some of the greatest, like somebody like Danny Gatton, you know, to take their own life. It's almost like I'm so amazing and the world doesn't notice. Well, the world fuck. is still reeling from that. You, you know, know, you know, he's just one of many. And he still, you know, it's what he did. It's all awful. And it's like, you know, we have, we, we need to uh, look out for each other because it's a really difficult world out there. And it's like, never been more difficult because nobody's making money now, you know? Exactly. And it's like, you know, and it's a, uh, a, it's an art form, you know, you're putting your heart out there. Check. 22 so cents. Your, is that your Spotify check? This was from music reports. And this was from something called Amazon Prime. 2019 ASOA royalties, 25 cents. It's not even worth going to the bank over. I know, I know. Um, Mark Bonilla says I, I burned it. It was way more fun than, than than the, you know, way less demeaning than actually cashing it. You know? Right. You said it costs more in postage to send it to you than it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like what 50 cents to send something now, and yeah. every you know envelope is like 50 cents. What's the point? Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's not like an insult, you know, when you open it. Give me your four other. Give me your four other. Uh, uh, I don't know if I can take a four. Okay, let me think about this. Um, Robin, Guth you know, Robin Guthrie from the Cocteau Twins. There's a surprise. Ah. Think about him. Just a you master. Know, like, of I put them in the same department as Dead Can Dance and uh, and the Cowboy Junkies and the actually not even Cowboy Junkies like that whole like late '90s uh, dream pop. Uh -huh. And everything I've heard sounds great. The problem is they're an 80s band. And um, that's my biggest pet peeve is a lot of 80s production. Oh, drum yeah. machine, chorus, digital dr uh, drums, you know, digital sounds. And it's rough because there's so much great music that I haven't gotten into just because when I would buy records when I was a kid, there was two things that would keep me from buying a record is... 1987 or 88 those were the years that i'd stayed away from for like the plague and the word programming you put the word programming on a record and fernando perdomo was not going to buy it <laughs> well, I, I, i'm of a similar mindset you know i mean i kind of suffer through it just if the song's good enough 
but you know there's times where i just describe it as a piece of plastic sugar um or something in that ballpark well like you know like recently um the singer of talk talk died and everybody talks about how amazing um those mid mid 80s talk talk records are and what makes them interesting is they decided to abandon synths programming and basically make albums live in the studio. And that's why it's timeless. Right. Listen to the records, there's upright bass, there's like, you know, brush drums, and it's beautiful, soulful music. It's great. Right. So, number five, <clears throat> can I put two on one and choose yeah. guys? Ah. Oh, yeah, man. The, yeah. Yeah. I, I forget their names. Remind me, it's on the tip of my tongue. I know, I know. Those two guys from the tubes. Uh, yeah, and talk about talk me, about the psychology of music. Those two guys are incredible, but they didn't play a note on She's a Beauty. I know, I, and not on Talk to You Later either, you know, David. That's, Frost, that's David, all, that's all um, freaking... Uh, look at her. Look at her. Yeah, and yeah. Like, we, oh, you're the guy from the tubes. Yeah, man, talk to you later. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's another one. Um, and... Uh, Hold on, I just got a, the name's on the tip of my tongue. Who is it? Hold on a second here. My Google isn't working because I'm on my phone. Let's see here. Tubes Guitar, Roger Steen. Roger Steen. And um, Bill Spooner. That's Bill. it. Anyway, yeah, great team, two for another yeah. one. Um, Craig from Starship. Jefferson Lisa. Starship. How do you it pronounce was, the last name? Chichico? Chiquico? So. Okay. Yeah, man. Such yeah. tasteful playing, man. He, I mean, I know okay. everybody thinks Eff Jefferson Airplane is the shit and Jefferson Starship is just shit, but I don't agree, man. I, there's Jeff, I mean, uh, Craig just played the most tasty solos. So there's this thing that Dave Kersner always gets mad when I do, and it's a, it's a Greg Chiquiso trick. And it, what it is, is they had, a, they had a violinist named Papa John Creech. Yeah. And he used to stay. <laughs> right? Yeah, there's a couple solos. Was, uh, I'm trying to think and, of the solo that has him doing that. Uh, there's a two it's uh, it's uh, um, uh, okay. well, it's, um, Hyperdrive. Hyperdrive. Yeah. That's the song. That's the song. It's uh, that one. Uh, um, uh, I never told to stand in line. Oh, oh man, he does this crazy guitar solo that's all that. And it's just like it. And there's a song called St. Peter, uh, not St. Peter, St. Charles, off of the Dragonfly album that has one of the most amazing guitar solos. Oh, ever. yeah. It was later it. written as the main riff from Rocky Like a Hurricane. It's, it's, it's note for note, but it's amazing. And uh, he was incredible. He was great. I, I had a, a, a big period where I was listening to nothing but their greatest hits. And I absolutely love that album, Gold, which is great. And uh, man, so many incredible songs. And Chiquiso was great. And then one of the guys that really influenced me was, man, their bass playing was incredible. Uh, incredible. Uh, Pete Sears. Pete Sears. And uh, it was actually... A, interesting band because both of their bass players would switch off on bass and keyboards right uh, david freiberger or something like that Freiburg. yeah and they're both incredible bass players and uh, pete sears had a great tone man i mean again you know fender p bass ampeg just great tone man. oh yeah there's a great there's a great tune on here called hot water that has like yeah. the most amazing bass intro on it you know and it's just because of the tone it's not really he's not playing much but it just sounds so damn huge and you know, I, I um, they get a bad rap because they weren't Jefferson Airplane, but for me, for my dollar, I prefer Jefferson Starship to Jefferson Airplane. I do too. I mean, I, don't, I mean, I enjoy some of the airplane stuff, but it's just a, you know, it's kind of a late '60s kind of vibe, and it doesn't. It's not as timeless. When you listen to somebody to love, you think flower power. Right. But you listen to stuff like, man, miracles, like, and or, count on me, uh, you know. And, Jane, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's um, incredible. Um, it's it's amazing music, and then and then Starship. What what happened there? You know. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, 
just look at the date on the label and you'll understand. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. It's like, exactly. okay. Well, I really can't listen to We Built This Shitty anytime. You know, oh, it's, all- I, it's a guilty pleasure, man. I can think of worse. Yeah. <laughs> one more, one more. So number five, gosh, I don't know. I'm going to say Jeff Lynn. I know that's crazy. Nobody <laughs> thinks about him as a, a guitar player, but. Well, he was incredible in the move. He was incredible in the idle race. And then, he, you know, again, he was a Beatle file and he came from the George Harrison school of less is more, but his guitar playing is fabulous. I mean, it's really great. It is, um, you know, just, there's not a whole lot of solos on, on the big hits, but you know, that, that fuzzy solo on Mr. Blue Sky comes to mind, just a yeah. tape, little, you know, echo of the vocal melody. Um, Every note that, counts. What's that? Every note counts. Absolutely. You know, and um, yeah, Jeff's just great. You know, I've, I've had the pleasure of playing an ELO tribute for the past year and just nice. dissecting all those songs has been so fun. And it's like, it's, you know, when you wind up learning in a tribute, you, you dissect somebody's catalog, you really kind of kind of notice their moves after a while, you know, compositionally. And Jeff, you know, it's, it's very rooted in, in 50s rock and roll. And uh Every time he hits a four chord, he goes from major to minor in almost every fucking song he's written, <laughs> uh, which is, is, is kind of just a Jeff move, man. But he always makes it work. It never sounds cliched like you hear it coming, you know, and that's that's the, the mark of a master. I love that stuff. Oh, yeah. 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 Big fan. Definitely. And it's just fun to play that stuff. It's fun to be in a tribute where we've got, you know, an hour's worth of hits to play. Ah, it's ah, such a treat, you know. Yeah, my and, friends uh, play in the orchestra, uh, which is uh, the band with Nick Kaninsky and uh, right. which other guys, Arthur and Huxley, and and it's like they they you know man, it's such great music. It's amazing music to play. Yeah, you they, know, it's so well written. It really is, and we had a pretty big band. We had a cellist and a violinist and two keyboard oh. players including one guy that was triggering samples for all your little backwards stuff and all that other stuff that pops up here and there. And yeah, it's fun. I hope we get a chance to go out. If we could find a way to play outside, I'd be happy. You know, you know what your favorite I, yellow guitar solo is? Um, Fire on high. Moment of paradise. Oh, wow. George Harrison. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. You know, is I got to say, I, I love George's lead playing. He's probably my favorite Beatle, although I don't know. It depends on the day of the week, but he's my favorite slide guitar player. You know? Uh, you know what I love about him is that there is no Southern inflection. It's like, it seems like you can't get away from Southern inspiration on slide playing. And that's great. It, it, it is a thing. It is Americana, but it's refreshing to hear somebody go at it without any of that influence occasionally. And George is a great example. And it's just such a great vocal tone. I just, I love it. You know, it's joyous. My, my slide heroes are Steve Howe, George Harrison, Jimmy McCulloch, uh, freaking uh, uh, Todd Rundgren. Uh, so many great players, but uh, I'm necessarily into blues slide, you know, freaking yeah, bottle. Kind of, kind of the rub for me. But yeah. I'm not, doesn't say, it doesn't, Dwayne Allman's great. You know, oh, he's brilliant. And the work he did, you know, it, it stands alone. You know, it's the top of the map. Incredible. But, like, but that's a different headspace. That vocabulary of slide is not my thing. I'd rather play a melody on slide. I love the sound of doubled slide. I, and that's the George Harrison sound. That's right. that. You know. And uh, one of the greatest slide parts of all time is I Saw the Light by Todd Rundgren. I mean, in harmony. That's, that's some next level stuff and again no blues it's a melody it's a beautiful thing two more guys two more guys gosh well, let me think about this for a minute are you sure I didn't know, five already? Five <laughs> a lot of mine are really pretty obvious um i'm flipping through some records here to see if anything else catches my eye you know daryl Sturmer. you know is yeah. a guy. His name doesn't come up too much, but he's amazing. John Luke Ponte, Aurora, John Luke Ponte, uh, Enigmatic Ocean. Right, yeah, Aurora, um, yeah, Enigmatic Ocean. You know, 
hearing him kind of spar with Alan Holdsworth is, is interesting because nobody spars with Alan Holdsworth. <laughs> you know, he wins the battle, in my opinion. My favorite, because on the, uh, uh, one of my favorite tracks of all time is Animatic Motion Part 2. And that's where it's like John Luke, followed by Alan Sturmer, followed by Daryl Sturmer, followed by Alan Zavog, followed by Holdsworth. And it's like Alan's, you know, Daryl Sturmer's solos are my favorite of those four. It's the best. You know, I love it. Fiery, fiery melodic fusion. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great right hand staccato picking, which yeah. is like, you know, I think that's why Pondy liked the, the two of them on that record, because it's like Mr. Yeah. Staccato and Mr. Legato. Exactly. Just, all they need well, is Mr. Well, Roboto. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of the uh, Hagstrom Swede, and that was the Daryl Sturmer machine. And he played a he played a Hagstrom Swede into a Sun uh, concert lead, which is a solid state amp. And you could totally tell that it's like it's not a tube tone, you know. But funny enough, Holtzworth got his tone through a Lab Series L5, <laughs> not a tube amp. So, you know, go figure. It's in the hands, you know. It's amazing. These these are this is my pedals right here, you know. <laughs> So number five, um, I'm going to say the the team of Livgren and Williams. Yeah, you know, Rich Williams, Polar Rich Williams opposite. in particular, I think is really underrated. Meatwall. You know, his nickname is Meatwall. Meatwall, yeah. Well, that tone of his is so thick. Yeah. I understand it. You know, well, yeah. first few times I heard him, everything about him was was rather fat. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I'm a fat so so. It's like you know, Meatwall. But but he lost a lot of weight and he's looking great and he still yeah. sounds fantastic. He still sounds but fantastic. Talk about a band with an image problem. If you ever go to YouTube, look up Kansas on the Dan on the day I'm sorry on the uh, on the um, Kirshner the Kirshner Rock Hour, and it's like <laughs> Rich Williams in overalls with a huge fro and a glass eye. You know Dave Hope was fat. You know Livgren kind of like you know. Livgren and uh, and and uh, you know the drummer they're like you know twins, and then Steve Walsh was not yet muscle bound. And he's this little skinny guy behind the organ, you know. And they definitely had an image problem, but they definitely powered through. Oh, they're that. amazing! I mean, those first that any of those Kirshner uh, appearances are just some of the greatest Kansas yeah. footage ever. The pinnacle. Oh, oh. They, yeah, Mysteries of Mayhem and The Pinnacle, which was this 15-minute epic that they cut in half on the record. But, you know, you get the whole thing there. Um, and then, you know, the, and then the one, the first episode where they, you know, for the first album, they looked like they just fell off the, the hay truck. And exactly. Journey from Mary and, 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 and in you know, overalls, you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, but, and Dave Hope is doing the number one fat guy mistake, which is he had a tucked-in shirt. Uh, which made him look even fatter. And again, it's just like, you know, oh, wow, it's fat prog band, very rare, because that was one of the jokes. It was like, you know, that there's that album by uh, um, Bachman Turner Overdrive called Not Fragile, which is their their kind of inside joke and in saying they're the anti-yes. Right. So, you know, because they looked at guys like Steve Howe and they're like, oh, he looks fragile, you know. And meanwhile, you have Bachman Turner Overweight and they're like, you know, they called their album not fragile. So, you know. Okay. All right, fat jokes and rock. Woo! Good but um, out of those Kansas solos, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to discern who was who. But yeah. I think I got pretty good at it after a while. Um, a good example is that tune on the other side where they kind of trade off. Or, yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Well, the um, classic carry on with the sun, where it's like yeah. you've got the fluidity and speed of, you know, Kelly Carrie Livgren and and the, the the just the the amazing pinch harmonics and tone of Rich Williams. Yeah, exactly. And God, just the man. But yeah. very like Rich Williams more pentatonic based, and then you know uh, Carrie is more like a, a kind of melodic fusion Daryl Sturmer type guy. Yeah, uh, Hence, one of my favorite I, Carrie solos is I, on the tune "People of the South Wind." Oh That's yeah, I love that. Song. Amazing solo, so perfect, and um. I'm trying to think of one for Rich. You know, they did, all, you know, one of the albums that they did where Rich really shined was that album Freaks of Nature. Did you ever hear that from the 90s? 
Oh yeah, I saw, it was the first Kansas tour. I saw. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah, there's just one guitar on that whole album, and it's rich. And it's like, wow, okay, I can really get a handle on his style now that I kind of hear it, you know, without having to guess if this is somebody else. Right. Um, right, and he was always he was always mind blowing. I mean, it was amazing that that band was able to consolidate to one guitar player and still survive. Right. Uh, but, but then again, you know, the secret too is that they had a, a keyboard player too at the time. And, and then uh, the violin player would play a Steinberger at the end and blow some leads on, on Carry On We Work Son. But still, it was it, it was the Rich Williams show, and he was amazing, and he still is great. Yeah, and I'm glad Paul again because I'm not a PRS guy, so you know. I so agree. Good. I agree. Um, my favorite I use them, you know, but you know they never spoke to me. <laughs> and it's interesting because, you know, Kansas pared it down to five people and had a pretty lean lineup, you know, like in the nineties and two thousands. And now they're up to like seven guys, seven or eight guys, you know, it's like, it's kind of like King Crimson. It's almost like an orchestral approach or a symphonic approach. Cause you've got such a thick sound with so many people there. And, and uh, it's all amazing players. Yeah. Exactly. For symphonic rock. I think, it's better to have more than less. <laughs> I liked David Mannion, man. That freaking oh, record, great. Uh, great. He was awesome. Yeah. He brought back Morgan. He brought back the P3. So exactly. Yeah. You know, I was talking to Tom about that, and you know, he of course was able to start fresh and build his own rig. You know, and um, and his attention to detail is so good. It's almost like I don't miss the Hammond because he knows how to find a really great emulation of it, but. You know, there was some times in the 90s when I think Steve Walsh didn't really care. He probably played the Hammond for so many years. He was just glad. Oh, no, no. So the first five times I saw Kansas, he was playing two Kurzweils. Yeah. And, yeah. It, you know, I was a gear snob. I was uh, I was a little bummed about that. But well, uh, I just thought that whole era was a little light on the keys. You know, yeah. instead of having two going at once, we had one that you could only hear half the time. Yeah. <laughs> and it was. Well, my pet peeve about Kansas in the 90s and 2000s is that Walsh would change his uh, his phrasing on everything. And I always felt like he was playing around with the phrasing a little too much. You know? Uh, I, I don't know. I feel like if anybody had a right to do it, it was him. And after yeah. singing the song, no, so he's, if it, he's probably just trying to entertain himself after singing them hundreds of times, in a way. I love that device voice drum concert, though. That's, I was at that. I was actually that, at that. Yeah. We're at that. Yeah, that was filmed here in Atlanta at Center Stage. Awesome. Yeah. That, Man, that, that was a really great show. I'm Johnson amps. That was a good sounding guitar tone. Yeah, I was just saying, I mean, you could probably find those used now for next to nothing, you know? Man, I saw King Crimson where Adrian Ballou was playing two Johnsons. I and remember. You know, the story on those Johnsons, it's basically what a, um, it's, it's exactly what an X FX is now. It's the same guy. Okay. The guy who designed the Johnson designed the Axe Effects. And that's why Baloo uses the Axe Effects. That's why Fripp uses the Axe Effects. It's the same interface and the same sounds, but better. Well, how do you feel about that? Are you a purist when it comes to amps too? Or are you willing to use some modern stuff depending on the situation? I'm gonna blow, I'm gonna blow my cover here and say that um, I, oh my God. I cut all of the first two out to see records with Amplitude. IK Multimedia's Amplitude. And Amplitude is still one of my secret weapons in the studio because I'm an amp guy. I'm a pedal guy. But Amplitude fills in all the blanks. And my old studio, Reseda Ranch Studios One, was not properly set up to mic an amp. And I ended up completely using IK Multimedia's Amplitude for pretty much everything I did there. And all my clients loved it. And it's a great sounding unit. And recently I was uh, endorsed with, with uh, Magnetone and I've been using the Magnetone Twilighter amp uh, in the studio. And that's changed my life because that thing sounds smoking. And uh, I love it, but the Amplitude software is incredible. I mean, it's it's, it's the best sounding emulator. And, you know, in Miami, I'm from Miami, Florida. I spent the first uh, 15 years of my career working out of Miami. And I played on a lot of Latin records. And the number one thing you'll find in Miami is Line 6 Pod. And it's what every guitar player used for years in Miami. 
that's the Miami sound. I used and it myself back 15 years I love ago. the Pod 2.0. I had the rack the, one, you know. Oh, the rack one. Yeah, I, I used that at Ace Freely Studio. It sounds great. But you know what's crazy? I got gigs because I was the one guy in Miami lugging around amps. And uh, I played on a number one hit called No Se Falta by King, by, uh, King, King Christian, C Christian Castro. And uh, I played on the original songwriting demo of uh, the song. And I showed up with my 65 Ampeg Verb Rocket and uh, my pedal board and my, my Telecaster. And they looked at me like I was a space alien. They're like, uh, we have a pod. I'm like, no, mic up my amp. I think this is the right sound for this song. And it was the right sound because not only did they, did they love it, they took the track off the Pro Tools and put it on the Finder Master. And it went to number one. That demo, which I did for 50 bucks, ended up going to number one. I got paid twice for it. But, you know, for a while I was the anti-digital. And then I got into the pod world. And then I got into the IK Multimedia world. And way before I met Dave Kersner, who works for IK Multimedia, I, uh, my band Dreaming in Stereo uh, was, at a, um, uh, was at a battle of the bands called the Florida Grammy Showcase. And I won Amplitude back in 2008, 2007. So I've been using Amplitude for going on 15 years, you know. So there you go. Good times. It's a very, great, great song. And so let's go back a little further. Like, what was your very first guitar? And how old were you? Good question. My, it's, it's too bad I'm not in my studio, I'm in my living room. But my first guitar, my first good guitar. Well, I, okay. I, my brother had a guitar and I strummed it a little bit. And I ended up getting my own guitar, which was a harmony, a little harmony acoustic. But my first real guitar was a Guild S100, which I still have, which I played on Dave Kersner's uh, New World record. Um, that's that's the guitar I used on Stranded and a bunch of stuff. And that's a great guitar. And uh, that was my first good guitar. My first Classicals in Miami, it's a Guatemalan guitar. Um, and then my first good acoustic was a Favilla that I don't have anymore, that I kicked myself for not having anymore. But... Uh, yeah, that guild has stood the test of time. I had a killer blue Mexican Strat in high school that I kicked myself for selling as well. That was my Steve Caton guitar. I actually put Tori Amos pictures on it. And uh, I was so obsessed with, with Caton that I was like, he played a Strat and that really got me into it. And then it became my Adrian Ballou guitar. And I learned a lot on that. And um, But yeah, my guild S100, which I still have. I Very love. cool. And you've got quite the collection now. And I think when I talked to you last time, you oh. said you had about 70 or so. It's up there. It's up there. And, Where do you uh, put them all? Do you have like a room just for storage? Well, right now my living room is one, two, three, four, five, six in my living room. And then the rest of them are my guitar or my studio. And then I have a storage room here that I have my two cell pile. Okay. Well, I don't but, have uh, really that many, but I've got about, I don't know, 20 something. And I, I have you know, a people walk in and say, why so many guitars? And I say, did Leonardo da Vinci have one paintbrush? I was say, did they have one color of paint to work with? No. Exactly. You know, you know, it's like, does, does, does uh, a supermodel only own one dress? Yeah. You know, it's like, the, it's all colors and textures and, you know, it's just nice to have it all. You know, it isn't you, really about, I, I'm not about redundancy much, you know, it's more about, you know, unique tones for each one of them. I go to a session and I bring six guitars usually. I bring uh, acoustic, six. Sometimes I bring an acoustic 12. I bring a 12 string electric. I bring an electric sitar. I bring a Variax. I bring a Les Paul type guitar. I bring my Mustang and my Tally. And I also bring a Gretsch. And that's my usual go-to in this town and i use them all they love the electric sitar they love the 12 string oh, they imagine. love flat steel you know it's a good thing to do you know I, I just love that stuff and um i i personally consider guitar playing on records to be an art form and i love the sonic element of it i love phasers i love tremolos i love delays i love tweaking a delay with my foot while i'm playing 
you know, I love volume pedals. I love wah. So, you know, I, I love the art of guitar. No chorus for you though, right? You know, I've, I've used it before. Uh, I generally am more of a phaser person. I like, you know what my favorite chorus is? The Boss Vibrato, the BV2. Oh, nice. But I have a Karen George I love. Really? And I also have one from Digitech that just came out that's fabulous. I love Leslie Speaker. Uh, one of my favorites is the Univibe. That's like I one. have a, I have the Micro Vibe from Voodoo Lab. Yeah, I've great. got um, I've got a smaller version, but yeah, for my wobbly kind of chewy sound, that's probably my favorite. And the Phaser, that's I all could almost leave that that Phaser on all night. I've kind of have to learn to wean myself off of it. And in yeah. chorus, chorus, if I'm playing a, like an '80s cover gig, chorus comes out. But that's really the only time I haven't well, seriously used chorus pedal gig. I played in a Hall and Oates tribute band. And I, they mostly played indie stuff, and I had to have that chorus. Right. And it, it, it I, my favorite chorus is something called the Fender Starcaster chorus, which is an analog chorus that used to buy at Walmart for twenty bucks. And it sounds incredible. It sounds thick. It doesn't lo- it doesn't kill your tone. Um, God, all my friends had little Boss C uh, CE threes or whatever. The light just, blue one, right? Yeah, and yeah. or were built in chorus in a valve state amp. Oh, come on, man. Yeah. That's the tone that I would think of when I thought about my, my friends that had metal zones and valve state amps, you know? You know, Pretty I mean, cool. I love that sound 20 years ago, but it just started sounding really wimpy. You know? It has an like, I'd rather it's just, like, I'd rather just hear the guitar plug clean in with a little bit of reverb. Than... It's back. It's back. Uh, There's a guy named Mac DeMarco, and he's like the chorus king now. Yeah. And he's this hipster guy who does like hip alternative and his mm-hmm. main tone is a strat into a chorus pedal. Okay. You know, one guy did, that I did like when he used it is John Schofield. When he, you ever heard yeah. of it? Is that kind of yeah. fast kind of chorusy sound? That's well, there's of, also yeah. uh, the Michael Thompson sound and the, uh, the um, who's the other guy? Uh, oh God, L, M, L, Michael, uh, God, such a guy. Uh, the old swell through a chorus and delay thing, the 80s right. thing. Yeah. Sound on the Brian Adams records, you know? <laughs> yeah. <Not> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. I mean, you know. Just a bit dated now, you know, but. It yeah. kind of ruined Alex Lifeson for me for a while. Oh, yeah. I was really glad when he, like, went back to Humbuggers and left the chorus out. And it took him mm-hmm. a long time to wean himself off the <laughs> chorus. All those 80s records are tough for me because of some of the stuff that really doesn't do anything for me, which is, you know, it's funny when Kersner asked me to play um, on a Rush tribute album he was putting together, and he asked me to play on uh, on, uh, on um, one of the songs off of Signals, uh, uh, New World, not New World Man, uh, Outlaw Kid or something, and uh, it had all this chorus, and you know what I did? I grabbed the Rickenbacker 12 string and played all the chorus parts on a 12 string and oh. it sounds fat it sounds awesome yeah natural you know? chorus yeah. yeah the natural chorus of a little bit of out of tuneness here and there you know that's that's a lost art too and one of the cool things i've been discovering recently is the whole like eventide um harmonizer pitch thing the kind of like steve lukather van halen thing where it's like it's not necessarily chorus it's just mixing in a slightly out of tune sound mm-hmm. and that's big wide pan it left right big sound cool stuff i've been recently working with eventide with their pre with their plugins and man i've been addicted to the instant phaser and instant flanger which is the todd rungren sound oh yeah right that stuff is great how about the ottawa ever go for that jerry Auto- sound? when i think of ottawa i think of the song another underrated guitar player what I Am by Edie Bacall and the New Bohemian. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I forget that. Great band. guitar yeah. solo. But, Great yeah. guitar And I love that Ottawa thing. But I've never been really a deadhead, and I, a lot of people consider the Ottawa the Jerry, Jerry Garcia thing. I still haven't warmed up to the dead, you know, so I need to get into that more. But, you know, I like Ottawa. It's not on my pedal board. Well, you know, the, if the, I pull it up on, on, on Amplitude. I, I would suggest a um, an album called Blues for Allah from the Dead because yeah. I, I was kind of in kind of like you and my drummer is a huge Deadhead so 
even though he's into progressive rock and all kinds of stuff um he's that was kind of his roots and he made me a mix tape of all the different stuff he thought was great and um there's some pretty progressive stuff on there there's this tune called help on the way slipknot check it out cool. like whole, we'll check tone, it out. whole tone soloing and stuff it's like I, 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 man I, the my favorite era of jerry garcia is the travis bean era late 70s uh -huh. as travis bean tv 1000 sound is so great and uh, that's one of my dream guitars that i've never owned i have a kramer that's similar but um i'm still waiting for an extra five grand to be somewhere sitting around not doing anything to buy a truck. The, the aluminum headstock oh, and all that headstock. yeah okay wait thousand, thousand pounds but sustains for days i love that sound um, um who's the one that made that lucite guitar that everybody uh, dan armstrong yeah okay those things are heavies i used to have a, a univox copy and ed hale who we played with with transcendence has one and it's a great guitar and uh yeah uh curved air one of my favorite bands um both both uh both the guitar player and bass player for a while played one and uh i love them they're great they're cool but they're not my my bag and they get they they mostly get associated with like joe perry and uh and keith richards and uh you know not my bag i hear cool. you yeah, they're kind of neat but yeah not mine either um so um got a stack of records over here yeah, let's do the yeah. What you got? Ten records that inspired you and made you the guy you are today. Let's start early. Okay, great. I just featured that the other day on my page. Every day I feature a different album and and the Who, the Beatles. You know, I would say the Beatles were my first love. The Who were my second, and uh, Who's Next and Tommy and and Quadrophenia. Who by numbers, um, you know, a quick one. That stuff changed my life. And uh, what's funny is one of my early influences was actually VHS videos rental. Because again, we didn't have a lot of money. And we discovered that our local blockbuster was stocked with really great rock and roll videos. Uh -huh. And my older brother, who's 15 years older than me, he had a bad habit of bootlegging vhs tapes with two vhs machines i did it i did that all the time all yeah the time. you know no shame in that. and kids are all right oh yeah uh, the woodstock movie um you know that all that stuff uh tommy uh the who's last in 82 you know man pete townsend was a huge influence on me oh and me too man it this like record was a mainstay in my house and um, it also introduced me to the amazing sound of ARP synthesizer and VCS3 organ. It says here, VCS3 organ. No, VCS3 synthesizer, ARP synthesizer. That sound is incredible. And uh, I just love this. You know? Yeah, it's like the perfect album. Um, you know, for me, I think Tommy was the big one. I, I told this story before, but my, my older brother's like 16 years older than me. So he was bringing home all the great stuff in the late sixties, you know, like the first couple of Chicago albums, blood, sweat and tears. And I gotcha. just love the sound of the, of a band with the brass section. I just, I, I still do. Um, and then Tommy though was in the pile. And that was one that I just loved more than any of them. I didn't really know what it was about. I just thought it was about a, a guy that played pinball. I didn't really dig under the surface cause I was like three years old, but it, it really connected. Most incredible, well-written rock operas of all time really is and it's just um i've had the pleasure of actually performing it a few times in the last couple wow. of years it's been a real treat a real that's treat. incredible yeah uh, it, like the first record that ever moved me and i got to play it all those years later so yeah that was pretty cool yeah another huge influence oh yeah can we uh big around my house too absolutely all of those. it's one of my favorite guitar solos of all time um this record second side is unbeatable and uh it's just got so much heart and uh it's amazing that it was a band on its last legs because it's by far their best record to me so uh all hail the beatles which led to <laughs> what a must a influence to me sorry i couldn't find the vinyl because i had it on my wall for a while and i can't find it wings over america oh hell yeah this is the most awesome box set I've ever heard. It's so cool. It's got everything. But um, 
one of the most magical days of my life was February 17th, 1991. That day, VH1 did an all McCartney day. And I had an eight hour VHS tape and I put it in. And that's all I watched for months. Because oh, they showed a show. They showed all the old videos, all the new videos, because they were also pimping. It might have been 1990, actually, because they were pimping Flowers in the Dirt. Sure. And uh, Good my record. God, great record. Yeah, it really is. Uh, my Brave Face, uh, yeah. you know, uh, figure of amazing stuff. Rough but ride. that blew my mind, and I became a Wings nutcase. And I bought everything I could find. I bought books. I got obsessed with Jimmy McCulloch. And uh, you know what's really cool is that I was recently interviewed for a book that's being written about Jimmy McCulloch. And I gave a big dissertation on his guitar style. And I recently was also interviewed by a book called Paul McCartney After the Beatles, a Musical Appreciation, where I describe Paul McCartney's songwriting style post John Lennon. And it's a really cool thing because I'm big on songwriting. And uh, my God, Paul McCartney yeah. and, jo and Paul McCartney and Todd Rundgren are constantly fighting for my number one biggest idols. Totally and, uh, understandable. Let me ask you this. You know, the whole mystery about if Paul died and was replaced. Well, you know, my answer to that argument has been, the, you know, it boils down to the songs. Did the guy that replaced him write a bunch of songs I love? Yeah. Here's my question. Do you notice a difference in the songwriting style after that supposed swap up happened or does it just seem well, like a continuum? Fake to Paul you? played more keyboards. And uh, uh, if Fake Paul is, uh, or Fall or whatever, you know, he's then maybe he's my favorite, but it's technically impossible that it's a different guy. I and uh, just amusement. It's just... It's one of those things that's like for entertainment purposes only, you know, whatever. Paul McCartney did not die. The same guy that sang And I Love Her sang Maybe I'm Amazed. It has to be, you know. Or and how the hell, they gonna, where are they going to find a left-handed bass player? Come on. That just you happens know? to look and sound exactly like him, you know. Yeah. I mean, I've heard that it might be Angela Lansbury, but I'm not buying it. Oh, God. Great. <laughs> All right, you ready for this? Yeah. Okay, you know that might be not be the first one some folks would pick. Um, so what? Ram is, what you... Ram, is, Ram is better, but this record showed me that you could play all the instruments on a record and be a badass. Right. It also showed me that a record does not have to be a collection of pop songs, and it could be a little bit of everything. And this record is, I guess, the best word would have it is. It is uh, um, eclectic. Mm -hmm. And the same record that has beautiful songs like Every Night and Maybe I'm Amazed has Karina Crory, which is a drum solo, and Hot as Sunglasses, which is an instrumental. And it definitely influenced my music making because this record showed me that you could be expressive on every instrument and record it yourself at home. And it's a, a huge record for me. And um, I love it. Maybe I'm amazed. It's my favorite song of all time. Awesome. Love it. So, yeah, that's a great one. Um, another early influence. My favorite Blood, Sweat, and Tears album, BST4. Which one is this? Uh, uh, number what? Number four. Number four. Okay. You and uh, the. the only song on this record that anybody ever talks about is Go Down Gamble, which is great. But this album is such a spectacular statement. So it's the first Blood, Sweat, and Tears album that, that had no covers on it. They wrote all the songs on this, which was kind of like one of the reasons why it wasn't as successful. But this album drives me to tears. This album will make me weep. And uh, there's a song on here called Cowboys and Indians that everybody needs to hear. And it's a, a protest song about the way that people treat Indian uh, Native Americans. And it ends with a tuba doing a, uh, almost like a, like a, a native, uh, just in, 
everything about that song is absolutely mind blowing. And it has an instrumental called A Look to My Heart, which is uh, happens twice on the album, which is absolutely gorgeous. And it has two of the best songs by Steve Katz, who, by the way, is another underrated guitar player, singer songwriter. He wrote a song called Sometimes in Winter off their second album, which is my favorite Bill Twin Tour song. But he wrote two songs on this record, a song called For My Lady and a song called uh, Lisa Listen to Me. He also has another song called Valentine's Day on the record, which is great. But man, For My Lady is by far the most romantic and beautiful song I've ever heard. Blood, Sweat, and Tears are my top five favorite bands of all time. It's awesome. And it's also my dream gig. I want to play bass for Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Make it so, universe. I'm working on it. Um, another record that's an early influence on me, which is a mind blower because I got to work with them. Curve their second album. Oh, very cool. This is the actual copy I bought, not at Amoeba. This is a sticker that got stuck onto it because I had this on my wall because I had it up like this. Okay, so this record I bought when I was 12 years old and I absolutely fell in love with the music. I was enthralled by this picture, which is uh, four naked men surrounded by a kneeling woman, which is a really bizarre thing, but um, sex sells. But this record is absolutely amazing. And uh, what's really cool about it is that it's glorious. There's a song on here called Jumbo about being on a plane uh, that just drives me to absolute tear. Peace of mind, which is absolutely incredible. And then the opening salvo of Young Mother and Backstreet Love. This is prog to me. And I got to work with them when Dave Kirchner and I produced the Yes tribute. Uh, 50th anniversary of Yes, and they did soon, and I got to work with uh, Sonia and the new band. And uh, man, Sonia is still uh, the best. Incredible singer, absolutely gorgeous, incredible person, and incredible human being. And uh, I was on Cruise to the Edge, and Kirzner and I were putting together this Greg Lake tribute, and I wanted to get Sonia involved, and she sang some of the and uh, she had never sung it before and she was a little nervous. And I said, you're Sonia Christina, you're gonna do great. And she killed it so much and it was so amazing. And we had a rehearsal in her hotel room and she uh, practiced one of her songs on my guitar. And um, it's really mind blowing to be such a big fan of a band and an artist to be serenaded pretty much as far as I am from the phone. And uh, it was great and uh, I'll never forget that. And I'm looking forward to working with them again someday. So awesome. again, right there. Um, no surprise here. <laughs> so uh, the guitar, which the first, is that the first Bee Gees album? Oh, uh, this is a record by Primus or something, right? No, yeah, no, that's it's, right. Uh, it's called. This is by, this is by the, uh, the 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 uh, the Lennon. Uh, delirium no the american this dental the american the, the british dental society <laughs> and i was gonna pull out uh lizard because i love that record just as much as i love this but this record just changed the world this is oh, like yeah. the moon you know I mean, it's, it's like 1969 what happened woodstock the americans land on the moon and king crimson comes out and starts Prague pretty much because you know yes with peter banks they were still kind of like not necessarily um, what we call prog these days. They were still incredible. And you talked about the first record, which is incredible. But yeah. this, 21st century schizoid man, yeah. my mean, God, nothing sounded like that. And nothing has sounded like that since. Well, you know, some groups kind of take a few couple albums to kind of get it together and make their definitive statement. And these guys just came straight out of the gate, like bang. And um, it's like ground zero well, for progressive rock. Really Let's compare these two records. Yeah, there. Yeah, here's a band that needed an album or two to kind of get the, get it together. Yeah, know. and I love Trespass, and I love this record. And actually, um, uh, yeah, it's a charming and I record. Working, we're working on a Genesis tribute now, and I'm in charge of uh, bringing some of these songs to life. And there's some amazing songs on here. Am I very wrong? Uh, one one day um, in hiding. There's some great stuff on this, but oh my god. This is nothing compared to this. This is oh, yeah. this like first album 
they made their they had to catch up after this you know it's a it's a mind blower you, you know, know while we're talking about crimson i should mention your uh, album the crimson guitar that fernando yeah, that was an incredible like, experience. like solo guitar interpretations of many uh classics from crimson um yeah where, where, where was the best place to get that at that's available on my bank camp it's also available on cherryredrecords.com uh basically if you're watching in europe i would suggest ordering from uh cherry red uh, you know, my, my band camp, I have some options to send you a signed CD and stuff like that. So, you know, whatever, just it's buy great. It. And it got, you got Robert Pritt's attention. If, if he liked it, no, it's great. Mastelotto and Jeremy Stacy's attention. So that's four crims. And, uh, okay. I've never been the most technical guitar player. So I was honestly very afraid that this album was going to get ridiculed for being too simple. And people love it. No, it's I a great think... record. It's a great album to listen to while you're doing the dishes or doing some your taxes or whatever. And it's like the funny story about it is, I was learning classical guitar when I was 10, 11 years old, right around the time that I discovered King Crimson. And one of the first things I started doing was figuring out King Crimson songs on classical guitar, and um, some of the arrangements that are on the record were from when I was 11 years old. So it's 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 been a long process. But I had gotten a new classical guitar, a La Patrie from from Canada. Um, I have an, uh, I have a strange affection for uh, Spanish guitars made by non-Spanish people. So I have a British <laughs> classical guitar. Right. I have uh, uh, I have a Canadian classical guitar, and uh, you know I have Japanese classical guitars. So it's funny. So, but this this Canadian classical guitar is the Crimson guitar. And I wanted to record it. And one of the first things I recorded on it was Piece of Theme. And I'm like, oh, this sounds right. really good. Come up with 10 more. And now I'm working on Crimson Guitar 2, which is going to be the Baloo era. Oh, uh, very nice. Discipline through Frack. Can I, can I request Dig Me? <laughs> Whoa. See, that's that, um, for classical guitar, if I do something that's very technical like Dig Me, uh, it, it might, I don't know, it, it might change the format a little bit. I'm doing stuff like frame by frame, Mate Kudasai, um, uh, Walking on Air, uh, you know, just the beautiful stuff, Inner Garden, you know, oh, it's going to be cool. heartbeat. I've got a bunch of stuff I'm coming up with, so we'll see. I'll try anything for you. No, I'll do anything. Um, oh, by the way, um, I had an album come out uh, tonight. Um, the new album by Life on Mars, which is called The Observer. Is that you so, on the cover? No, that's no. actually Earl Chaos, who okay. is uh, the, uh, the the spearhead of the band, the songwriter, singer, guitar player. And uh, Earl and I have made four records. We've worked with people like Durga McBroom and uh, Jamie Glazer of uh, John Ponty. And uh, uh, this record has got Scarlett Rivera on it from the uh, Rolling Thunder Review. And it came out tonight at 8 p.m. So oh, awesome. Yeah. I and mean, how would you describe the music on this one? Bowie meets Dylan meets Nirvana meets Pink Floyd. Okay. That's an interesting blend. It's really cool stuff. And we have Zach Nelson singing a song, who's Harry Nelson's son. Right. And uh it's great stuff. Uh um Earl's written like seven hundred and fifty songs that are all great and eventually we'll record all of them but we've done four albums of this so you know all right back to influence yeah, go get it folks yeah it's really cool okay here's a weird one headkeeper by dave mason oh very nice okay I, you this know, record he... came out after alone together and half of it is live at the troubadour and half of it is in the studio and every song is absolutely killer. And every time I play the Troubadour, I mentioned that this is one of my favorite albums of all time. This record is a mind blower. Um, he does stuff like Pearly Queen, uh, Feeling All Right, but he also does stuff like Rolling Changes and Just a Song. And uh, it's so good. And uh, there's a track on here that absolutely kills me, uh, which is a song called To Be Free. And oh my God, it's just so good. And um, my mind is blown because uh, I have a new band I'm working with that I'm playing guitar in called 
Nine Mile Station, and our album is being mixed by Al Schmidt, who produced this. Oh, and awesome. uh, you know, that's that's a big full circle for me because yeah. I bought this for the first time on cassette in a dollar bin when I was maybe nine years old, and a big huge influence on me is this record. Is this what year is this? Is this like after it's he was with Traffic? 71. Yep, after Traffic. Okay. Not 71 i think yeah, he's and, had a uh, really interesting career did you ever catch that album he did when he was with fleetwood mac called time yep, time yeah great but, stuff on that yeah that's a less obvious choice but really cool you know some of my favorite fleetwood mac albums are the less obvious ones are you a fan of that bob welch stuff future games oh yeah man love it love it bear trees well, another... big, uh, right around the time i was moving to la i was going through a big bob welch phase right after he died because i realized i was not hip to bob welch i only knew some of the lady and stuff, sorry, i only knew some of the lady and stuff like that and, right emerald and, eyes and uh and, yeah yeah ebony eye or whatever uh and and uh uh i really got into that era and they were so damn good yeah and bob I... Talk about another underrated guitar player nobody ever talks about. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, those rookers have a lot of a lot of mood to them. You know, they're just they're they're really cool. Um, so yeah, yeah. They, did, they did a lot of cocaine too. So you yeah. know, they were they were a party band. Oh but yeah. They, well, the tempo. You know what though? You want you listen to the live stuff from them, and Mick kept those tempos where they needed to be, despite being gacked to the nines. Yeah. So kudos for that. Most people. I, always, I read stories about them spending a week on a bass drum sound. <laughs> right. So they were they they were lucky. They were so rich, right. and they were so they were they definitely lived the high life. And like, it, it ended, ended uh, up almost killing him, you know. Uh -huh. uh, like and, uh, several several grams later, we've got that kick drum dialed in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, here's another weird one that's going to blow your mind. Oh, dude. I mean, fucking Vinny's on that. Yeah, but Vinny's not the main reason I love this record. Well, you want to know the reason I love this record? Because every song's amazing. The songwriting. Yeah. This is one of the few records that I could listen to that I can't listen to just one song. I listen to it all the way through. Yeah. This might be my favorite driving record of all time. It's so amazing. And there's a song on here called Sally, She Says the Sweetest Things. Yeah. I want to play to my damn funeral. It's yeah, amazing. Um, you know, a lot of people probably just take him as some sort of 70s crooner, but my goodness, his, he top shelf bands, amazing production. Yeah. Oh, I mean, just, yeah. Wait, this album, Nightwalker, it's probably like his, it's like the last one before he went all 80s synth pop. And he did another record called uh, Something Heart that's unreleased that he scrapped because he decided, oh, no one's going to buy this. I need to go drum machines. Yeah, they made black cars. And it's like black cars and wild horses or whatever. Right. Not, in the, Not good. I love you, Gino, but man, the thing about Gino Vanelli is the musicianship and the live drums. He had the best drummers in the world. I mean, oh it started with, with uh, freaking, um, oh, God. Santana's drummer, not Michael Shreve, the replacement. Graham Lear. Mm -hmm. Graham Lear. And then he had Casey Shirell, who got whisked off to John Paul Ponte World, who's amazing. And then uh, Mark Craney. Mark Craney, man. Talk about, you know what's really weird is that Mark Craney and uh, Carlos Rios only played on one Gino Vanelli record. How did that happen? I mean, why did they not try to reuse the formula of brothers and brother? Right. But no. yeah. this record does not reinvent, does not redo brother to brother. No, it's I so, think this it's one, dark. I think this one has a little more fire to it too. I was listening to brother brother today, brother to brother today in the car, and it was like, you know, it's an amazing album. But I just think that that other one's got a little more. Anna Rosa. Yeah, my Ooh. goodness! Wow. Wow. That's that is that is that is oral that is that is musical cocaine right there. Yeah, that's it's like so fusion with a capital F, but, but oh, songs, songs written. Neil yeah. Steubenhaus on bass, Mike Miller on the guitar. Oh, I recently discovered a band called Air uh, something. 
it's the Fowler brothers, uh, Zappa's okay. guys. Zappa. And with, uh, uh, oh God, with uh, Genesis's drummer. Oh, wow. Not Chester Thompson. Chester Thompson, Tom Fowler, all the Fowler brothers, and Mike Miller on guitar. Oh, wow. And it's, a, and it's called Air, I keep on thinking Air Pocket, but it's not Air Pocket. It's Air something. Just look up Fowler Brothers, uh, Chester Thompson. Okay. And it's a cool, it's an, uh, impossible to find. It's called Air something. And it's really, really good. I'm um, intrigued. Five years ago, we lost Chris Squire. Yeah. Out of water. Brilliant, brilliant. Maybe the best Yes solo album, and that's saying something. Maybe one of the best Yes albums. Yeah. Funny and yeah. the funny thing about this record, I have distinct memories of listening to this record, walking to the library, listening to a Walkman, and then going in the Walkman, going in the library, and reading books while listening to this record. And it's a mind blower. Canon song, uh, uh, freaking silently falling. Yeah. I'm you know it's this record it's it's unique you know there's really no yes album like it but anybody that loves 70s yes i think would like it and it's just these symphonic arrangements that are never you know sappy or anything they're powerful and you know kind of epic tunes that tune safe canon song that thing goes on for like 10 minutes and it just keeps building and building and then lucky seven that's you know such a great little pop nugget in oh. seven of course I mean, why else? Yeah, would they do that? the best. It <laughs> yeah. is absolutely the best. That that yeah. that is just like, man, it's some of the best music. Not just like rock, not just prog. It's one of the best musical statements ever made. Yeah, it's amazing he didn't do more, but I guess you know. You know. Uh, I messed up while grabbing something. My favorite album of all time. I did not grab, but okay. two more. Okay. It's Out of our hands by Flash. Oh wow! Okay. So that's your favorite flash? Mm -hmm. okay. Number three, lucky third. Um, this record changed my life. This record is perfect. This record is a huge influence. And now I'm in a band called The New Empire, where I basically walked into Peter's shoes with Mark Murdoch, who was the original, was in the original Empire. And uh, it's a big shoes to fill, but I'm happy to do it. Uh, Peter's a huge influence on me. And this record is a masterpiece. Awesome. An masterpiece um i thought i grabbed it my favorite album of all time is an album called war babies by hall and Oates. oh yeah so third war babies here i couldn't i had i had a little bit of a brain fart i was um i needed to get all the records and i i had trouble finding a lot of them because a lot of my favorite records i either put on the wall or uh or put on a record sometime or like it might be in a stack somewhere but war babies by hall and Oates is yeah my favorite album that's such a unique record um um a friend of mine is uh their 80s producer neil kernan and oh, cool. uh, he's been listing his favorite albums and that was on his list he said that was just the, you know before he produced them or anything he just loved that album to death and he loves todd to death so it's oh, kind cool. of a winning I competition a, i have a funny story so you recently had uh the jellyfish guys on yeah right. are, manning yeah him and uh you know it's the the, the best yeah, um, been my I most was, popular interview I mean, so far. <laughs> I was in a band called Price that got signed to Geffen Records and shelved. And uh, we, our audition for Geffen was at Ocean Way Studios and there was only three guys sitting on the couch. And we were from Miami. It was a band with three brothers in it and I was on lead guitar, but I was kind of like the other guy in the band. So it was these brothers the drummer and me, the back singer guy. And uh, the three guys were a guy named Tom Panunzio, who did a bunch of Aussie stuff and whatever. Ron Fair who was the president of Geffen at the time. And a guy who introduced to me, who introduced himself as Jack Joseph. And I said, Jack Joseph Puig. He's like, yeah, I'm like, jellyfish. And he's like, you're my favorite guy in the band. And, um, <laughs> He, I had a Fender Mustang, which I still love, my, my favorite guitar in the world. And uh, he's like, how do you get the sound? I'm like, it's Todd Rundgren. And he's like, you're a Todd guy? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you're a Todd guy and a jellyfish guy? And he's like, are you going to tell me you like War Babies? And he's like, 
I'm obsessed with war babies. And he took me aside and we started talking talk. Now, this is the dark side of the music industry. And he said, Fernando, can we have you for a second? And he took me outside and said, you're talking to Jack too much. You're not the lead singer. And also you're mentioning a bunch of artists that are not our influences. Don't mention Todd Rundgren ever again. Uh. And that was one of the first signs that made me quit the band when they got signed. Right. Uh, it was a personal issue too. My mom had gotten diagnosed and I had to stay in Miami. Um, but uh, there was some personal stuff. And uh, honestly, the manager rubbed me the wrong way. And I also kind of saw it coming that the industry was falling apart. They ended up making four records and nothing came out. Hmm. But I've kept in touch with Jack Joseph. He's awesome. But uh, we had this big moment and we were talking about War Babies when I got taken away, you know. And uh, that almost made me take that record under my wing as my personal favorite because everything about that record is amazing. And it's also an incredible, you know, a lot of people don't talk about pairing stuff with records and uh you know night driving with war babies is something you need to try all right uh, just drive nowhere you know get in your car and drive at two o'clock in the morning listening to war babies and i'm guaranteeing you're gonna cry when screaming through december comes on you're gonna cry when 70s scenario comes on you're gonna cry it's just going to make you lose all emotion. That record is so dark and goes to a place in the psyche that um, it's, it's a, it's, I don't do drugs. I don't drink, but there's certain records that I put on when I want my brain to get wired a certain way. And <laughs> War Babies is, there's a great quote I remember hearing once. Um, Sergeant Pepper is the sound of people doing acid for the first time in 1967. <laughs> okay. Or babies is the sound of somebody doing acid for the first time in 1972. <laughs> okay. It's the same drugs, different time, different city, different equipment. Mm -hmm. So this is New York, 1972. Two boys from Philly, three boys from Philly, uh, Daryl, John, and, and Todd doing acid for the first time and hitting record. And I talked to Todd about it and said, man, you're like one of my favorite slide players. And he said the geekiest thing I've ever heard. He said, I haven't really played slides since I lost my favorite slide. It was a pinch roller from one of the first IBM computers that he acquired from a junk store. And uh, it was basically part of one of those computers you see in the 60s movies it's a whole room. Right. He got like one hours. And he ended up pulling a pinch roller off of there and it became his favorite slide. <laughs> and that's the slide you hear on War Babies. And I said, Todd, that's one of the geekiest things I've ever heard. But it's amazing. Because when you think of guys like Dwayne Allman playing a Corrosidin bottle or whatever, yeah. or, you know, guys playing a bottleneck, Todd Rundgren played slide using a part of a Computer. Yeah, I think that's kind of apropos. You know, he's always been ahead of the curve. How ass backwards that is. I you know. know, blue slide is supposed to be a 1920s throwback. You know, yeah, like your 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 blind lemon your blind lemon whistle dick playing on a on a, on a stoop with an out of tune guitar that's tuned in in, in a, into a chord. You know, de -de 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 you know where it all started was like Hawaii, you know, with that yeah. lap steel thing. Yeah, slack key, you know, right, kawow, yeah. kawow, kawow with a Weissenborn. Right. You know, this is a guy with multicolored hair doing acid, playing slide on a Mustang with nines on it, direct into the board with going straight into a, an Eventide uh, instant flanger. That's completely ass backwards, but that's what makes me love the record so much. Yeah. It is Good job, Fern. You didn't grab your favorite record, but okay. it's we know so it. more babies. Cool. 
Well, again, tonight, my guest has been Fernando Perdomo. Um, check out his music at Bandcamp. Um, he's got a number of different um, albums available. What's the most recent one you did besides the Crimson Guitar? Well, okay, mm -hmm. I've done three Out to Sea records, which um, That's was... Right. I thank Dave Kurzner for so many things. He brought me into the prog world. And all of a sudden, I did a track in 2018 as a tribute to Peter Banks. And it was instrumental. And I said, I can make 10 of these. So I made a whole record of it. And now I've done three. And I'm currently working on um, an outtakes collection of stuff that's probably going to come out in the next few months. Uh, outtakes to see. But that's a whole other thing. Uh, but I also, um, I also, hey, Cindy, hey, Cindy, <laughs> she just sent me some out to seas so I can hold these up. More of my favorite records of all time. And, um, and the cover yeah, art that was, what was it? Was it Mark Wilson, Mark Wilson or Paul Whitehead that did the covers? Paul Whitehead. Paul Whitehead, yeah, the guy that did the Genesis covers back in the 70s. He did, he did uh, Nursery Crime, he did Foxtrot, he did Vandergraaf Generators, Pawn Hearts, he did Tom Fogarty record, he <laughs> did, uh, a bunch of really cool stuff. He did the famous Genesis logo, but he did these these three, so it's awesome. amazing. Awesome. And you think oh, that I'm those would be on. right up? Hey! Here. All three! Get them all! Collect them all! All right. So this would be uh, great oh. for Prague fans to check out. Okay. And, and I, also, I also put out pop records. So I did a record at Abbey Road called Zebra Crossing. I was just about uh, to bring that up. <laughs> that was an incredible experience. Again, uh, you, you know, as you've seen from the show, I'm a huge Beatle nut. So I got really into that stuff. And, uh, you know, somehow I was on tour with Dave and I had an opportunity of recording at Abbey Road on uh, September 26th or 25th. And I found out that that day was the 50th anniversary of the first time that they did um, uh, Mama Guitar Gently Weeps. So oh, it was like a whole day. So I did a whole day there. Cindy and I were there for most of the day, and then I called in a bunch of my friends to do uh, while my guitar gently weeps. And uh, I will never forget it for the rest of my life. I did not sleep the night before. Oh, I, did. I was so excited. I can imagine. So I mean, that's, just... that's the last normal pop record, but I put out a yacht rock record called Yacht. I recently put out a record called the Leo August album. On lockdown, I decided to write a bunch of songs as someone else. It's kind of a role playing thing. So I decided that I was going to become Leo August, who is this like singer songwriter who doesn't like guitar solos and is on his deathbed. And it's like a concept album about a guy on his deathbed. So that's the Leo August album. Very and then there's cool. Yacht, which Yacht, is that's right. me when I was five years old. Right. Uh, yeah. It's kind of a Yacht Rock tribute. So it's kind of my tribute to bands like Player and uh, Hollow Notes and, and uh, you know, uh, 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 Stephen Bishop, who I love. I, I expect a lot of major seventh chords. To lots say of it. That's right. Lots of laser too. And yeah. lots of Arp Salina string synthesizers. Ooh, now you're talking. Yeah, all my favorite things. Uh, Kersner and I are working on a Genesis tribute. We have a new band called uh, Squids in the Sea, which is uh, coming out with a new record soon. And um, and then uh, um, I've got the new Empire record coming out. Uh, looks like it's going to be for uh, the, the late, for like fall, uh, which is going to be great. And um, Nine Mile Station EP we're shopping right now. Uh, the new album by Life on Mars just came out. I'm a producer too, so I work with a lot of artists. I just oh, yeah. had an album out by an artist named Keela Tay, who's like a soul, psychedelic soul, like, uh, you know, very very cool stuff and uh yeah i mean look I, I produce a lot of records i work with a lot of singer songwriters in Racine ranch studios so yeah it's a cool thing that's awesome and uh you know if you guys are interested i'm sure fernando could help you if you have a album you're looking to put together you know yeah i also do a lot of uh um, in lockdown i've done a lot of um uh, remote recording i'm on fiverr um mm -hmm. i've been you know doing my services through there through my website you could hire me I can do guitar tracks, drum tracks, bass tracks, keyboard tracks, full production. Um, and I do this daily. I, Cindy, you know, was part of a conversation. She, she's a, a amazingly patient because I go in the studio after breakfast and I don't come out, you know, till, till dinner. So, you know, she's got so this patience. whole lockdown situation hasn't really messed your groove up, has it? Well, I, luckily I'm not, I don't make a living off touring. So 
you know, I had the both cruises canceled with the bomber, and I had a tour that I was going to do with again Roger from Dip as now a band called Ex Norwegian. We were going to tour Europe, and that got canceled. So you know, uh, I've got a lot of friends in cover bands that are having trouble, and it's like, you know, luckily we could go back into the studio and make some money, hopefully. Sure. How are you doing? Uh, you know, I'm hanging in there. You know, I think this show is the thing that's kept me the busiest the past couple of months. Good. Uh, you know, it just started as a chat one Saturday night with some friends that are in my band, and, and I started thinking, well, I've got some friends on here I could talk to that'd be pretty interesting. It's, you know, You're a great uh, interviewer. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm, 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 you know, I've been doing this on and off for 20 years. You know, my website, Progressive Ears, you know, yeah. has been like the place to talk prog since the late 90s. And yeah. Amazingly, it's still there and we still have a, a loyal audience. You know, I'm, I'm you know, I was figure kind of figured Facebook would be the end of us, but quite the opposite. It's like people kind of like it because it gives you a break from Facebook. Um, of course. So, They're and, great. you know, and I just thought, well, you know, I've been doing interviews. The thing I always hate about interviews is like you talk on the phone for two hours and then you got to go transcribe the whole thing. And I hate yeah. that part. And this modern age, it's almost like these Zoom interviews are the way to go anyway. So I just started looking at my friends list and going, well, you know, this could be a thing. And uh, three months later, you know, it's rolling. And um, like I mentioned before, next week, we got Billy Sherwood from Yes as our guest. Hey. July 4th. Uh, the following week, we got Nearfest Memories. So if you went to Nearfest, come on by and let's relive it. Um, following week, Wings guitarist Lawrence Juber. You want to come by and co host with uh, me? You want to I would love to join. I love Lawrence. He's great. I've okay. actually played a couple of shows with him. And, uh, you know, I worked with Denny Sywell too. And uh, you should get Denny on the show too. That'd be great. Maybe we could make it all happen at once. But that's probably happening in about three weeks. So if you want to co host with me, I'd love to have you. Lawrence is great. You know, Back to the Egg, I was just talking about Back to the Egg today. I, I, it's one of my favorite um, Wings albums. It's so underrated. It's, record and he's so so underrated. it's tough for him to replace both McCulloch's, you know? Oh, and, I can imagine. Uh, he, uh, he, had some, he had some tricks up his sleeve that they didn't have, so, you know, he's oh. his own man. He's an incredible classical, classical acoustic guitar player. Yeah, or and just thinking about all really that. Really whacked out stuff on that record. Yeah. What's you that? Know, he did some whacked out stuff on that record. Oh, yeah. And then other stuff like Good Night Tonight. It almost sounds like, you know, Flamenco. Guitar or something. It was such an amazing solo. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. looking forward to talking to him. And then uh, my good friend Valor Trucks is going to drop by the following week. And we're going to oh, wow. look at the Almond Brothers family tree from an insider's perspective. And That's he's great. a brilliant guitarist in his own right. Um, we, I met him. Uh, you know, we both lived in Atlanta for years, but uh, we have our we have mutual friend Mike Keneally, and uh, bumped into each other at one of his shows about ten That's years great. ago. And um, you know, I recently read the most amazing thing. Um, Joe English, who drummed in Wings for Wings Over America, yeah, he was sea level. Um, he, well, he was based in Atlanta when he got the gig. Yeah, he was living with. He was living with Chemo John and and uh, um, some Tony Dorsey, who was doing the arrangements on on, uh, on Venus and Mars, called Jaimo and said, "You know that Paul's about to fire his drummer, Jeff Britton, and they're looking for a guy. You know anybody?" And he's like, "Well, I've got this kid living on my floor, and I can fly him out there for you. He's a good kid. His name is Joe English, and his audition was playing on Venus and Mars." And he his audition was literally recording the song Spirits of Agent Egypt. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. And he stuck uh, around for a couple albums, right? Yeah, he stuck around for three albums. He did okay. London Town too. Okay. Uh, he did he did uh, three studio albums and a live album and he did all the tours from seventy five to seventy six. And uh Joe, <clears throat> you know, went on the sea level and then he became a contemporary Christian artist. And uh now he's in some type of weird cult church. Interesting. Uh, well, well not Valor's tuned in and he said that Joe used to babysit them. So really you have it. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. My yeah. favorite drummer. He also had a, a golden voice. Uh, I, I don't mind Christian records. I, I uh, actually, um, we just talked about uh, vinyl confessions. I love vinyl confessions. Oh yeah. Was, your favorite Kansas album, isn't it? My favorite Kansas album was vinyl confessions. 
It's my favorite because it's the only Kansas record where I don't really skip a song. Uh, I don't I don't do boogie very well, so you know yeah, I feel Lord like goes a long way. I have too many boogie songs, and I feel like that that's the record that I can't skip a song. At so all. do you? We can't wrap up the night without talking about this for a minute. My favorite Chicago album. That's right, number twelve, Hot Streets. Yeah, you know, which is a surprising choice. What is it about that one that resonates with you so much? The same reason why I love Final Confessions. It is the only Chicago album that's all killer, no filler to me. Well, to and be fair, a lot of them were long. <laughs> so. Yes, yes. There are a lot of them are Doubles. tough to get through, sadly. And there's some amazing moments on every single record they put out with, uh, with you know, Terry Kath on it. But man, you know, some of those records would have been perfect single albums. And hmm. I feel like the thing that Hot Streets does for me is it puts me in a place mentally and it makes me so happy because talk about a band that overcame the worst thing that could ever happen the accidental suicide of a band member that's so important as Terry Calf and Donnie Dacus man he got he got such a rap but he's incredible and my favorite Chicago song is on that record it's called Take a Chance amazing and uh, there's another song that Dacus did two albums with them he did 13 and 13 had a song that was, did not make the record. It's a bonus track. And, uh, you know, uh, my gosh. It's a great song that's co written by Stephen Stills. Um, uh, something for you. It's an incredible record. It's so good. But, um, man, I love those records because they went, they, they experimented a little bit with disco, they experimented a little bit with like radio rock, but it's so good. It's so good. And uh, I feel like those records are so perfect. And it's got that Caribou Ranch, you know, also like, actually, you know, what's cool about, about Hot Streets and 13 is that those were done by Phil Ramone and right. they were Criteria. So they went from the Caribou Ranch sound to the Criteria sound. And I love that sound, man. That drum sound is insane. It's, yeah, it's punchy. Um, Alive Again, I think, is one of their great singles, too, man. It just starts the oh, album yeah. off with the big hooks and uh great arranging um well so. listen to take a chance okay that's i'll take a chance on, take a chance take a chance on take a chance i will do that well i remember you saying you'd love this one so i kind of love that it's a weirdo it's a we definitely a no, man it's cool you know these you know every album has its 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 lovers and haters i guess and uh, it's nice to see some of the underdogs get some love <clears throat> yep good times brother well, I better wrap it up tonight, but thank you, brother, for being part of this. It's it was so fun. much fun. Yeah. I mean, we can just do talk all night, you know. It, it's, it's like midnight gets here before I even know it sometimes. It's all right, man. Uh, yeah. You know, music is a fun thing to talk about, especially in these weird times, you know. I know. It's like if we can't play it, then let's at least talk about it, you know. Oh, yeah. That's the thing to do. So, so let's uh let's hook up and talk about the the wings night coming up in a few weeks, and uh I'll that's talk great. Really soon, and I'd love hey, to get Dave on. Is that we didn't even talk about Echo in the Canyon? Yeah, well, let's do that real quick before we wrap it up. You know, um, that's where I got to meet you at. I went to see a screening of the the do uh, documentary. It's basically about the Laurel Canyon scene in California in the late 60s with the likes of the birds and the monkeys and even Frank Zappa was there though he yeah. was kind of not a part of that musical scene he was uh you know he was living in the canyon anyway and uh yeah and Jacob Dylan you've been working with yeah. put together a group to perform Look, man that's everything I wanted out of LA and I I came out here not expecting anything to happen in my first few years 2012 I moved here 2013, I met Andy Slater, who um, came into a club where I was playing an unpaid jam and said, you're great. And then all of a sudden, I jammed on a song called Mr. Soul by Buffalo Springfield. And he said, I need you on a record I'm producing. And I had no idea what it was. I went to a studio, heard Jacob Dylan's voice. And he said, okay, so this is a new Jacob Dylan duets album. And it's all songs from the 60s. Um, we're going to have you play on this song called You Showed Me by the Turtles. And I'm like, I know it. I don't need a chart. I know it, you know. And actually, he's like, questions. 
by Buffalo Springfield. I know it. Go where you want to go by by Moments of Buffalo. I know it. You know, I love this stuff. I grew up on these records. And um, he says that all the placeholder vocals are by Jacob, but eventually they're all going to be replaced by other people as duets. And I started getting all the text messages I ever dreamed about. Hey, you remember in my room and uh, you know, Fiona Apple's on that one. Oh, you remember Bells Are In Me? Uh, Beck's on that one. Um, bad news, you're no longer playing the solo on questions. Eric Clapton is. <laughs> right. But you're on rhythm guitar on the track. Hey! Excellent. You know? So... It's a dream scenario, uh, but then the album became a movie, which basically delayed the album for another four years. Uh, for about a, two years of it, I was unsure if it was ever going to come out. And it finally came out as the movie. And it's on Netflix. I go in the canyon, and I'm all over it, and it's an incredible experience. It is. It's a great, great documentary. Um, wonderful renditions of the songs that you guys do. And yeah. What was kind of cool is you did the little tour where basically i went to the theater i watched it and then you all came out and played right in the front row and i made a joke one night i'm like it was echo in the canyon 3d <laughs> yeah exactly and you tore it up it was wonderful thank you yes. that was a real incredible experience and i can't thank andy enough for bringing me into that world and uh, I got to work with, you know, Dave Way, who's an incredible engineer and producer. And you got to be like, you went on like Jimmy Fallon and a bunch of yeah, other we late night Fallon, shows. We did, no, we didn't do Jimmy Fallon. We did Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Kimmel, okay. On late night. Jimmy Kimmel and we did uh, James Corden. Okay. That Very, was incredible. Yeah, look those up, folks, because it's yeah. it's wonderful renditions. And uh, yeah. you're and then we got to the, the debut night and uh, we got to play with uh, Roger McGuinn. Oh, uh, Michelle Phillips and Steven still showed up and jammed, which was well, funny. ding dang, <laughs> ding dang. Well, well, the 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 craziest day, the craziest scene in the movie is when we're playing, we're recording a song at Capitol Studios, and in comes Brian Wilson unannounced, and <laughs> the expressions that we all have in that scene are real. Uh, I bet. It's like, yeah, I mean, the only thing that would have been crazier if Paul McCartney walked in too, but. Maybe I'll be an Echo in the Canyon too. I don't know. We'll That's right. Well, did, what, 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 I saw you with Ringo recently. What was happening there? Well, was well, that, that the debut Ringo, of the movie? No, Ringo's in the movie, and Ringo's good friends with Andy. And Ringo showed up to opening night, and because of my girlfriend Cindy and my friend Ken Sharp, who I produce and work with, I said, "Hey, I got to meet Ringo." And there's a video on YouTube where Ken says, "This is my friend Fernando," and Ringo says. Fernando, what's going on? Shakes my head. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, I met a Beatle in the coolest way possible. That's and he saw me play. So, you know, Paul, you're next. You betcha, Paul. Your time is coming. Yeah. Make yeah. it happen. <laughs> Hurry <Awesome. it> along. <laughs> so cool. All right, brother. Well, I thoroughly no, enjoyed the best. Chat. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Let's do it again soon. Next for week, sure. 4th of yeah. July. Yes, bassist Billy Sherwood will be here. So, oh, cool! I'll be, I'll be watching. Yeah, swim like a fish on over here and check it out. He's got lots of cool stuff to talk about. But yeah, Billy's Billy's great, and I, I love what he's done with Yes, and I love what he's done with all his projects. And he's a spectacular musician, great he, drummer. Oh yeah, okay. Well, we'll talk about that. I know he plays a bit of everything. He's got his own studio. Just like been playing with his dad when he was like thirteen or fourteen. And he was laying it down on the drums, man. He was originally a drummer. Okay, very cool. I'm looking forward to that. All Good right, time. All right, well, take care. Okay. Stay safe. And have a great night, everybody that's watching. And yeah. now you watch. <laughs> that's right. Stay safe, everybody. You're stronger than you know. Much love, everyone. All right, take care. Love you. Good night. Love you tonight.